we are we, yeah, yeah do that we are at 300 now we are yeah. full 300 do now that. we are full house yeah go ahead where is uh, john bolton okay good evening everybody <laughs> request all participants kindly mute your audio stop your video requesting all participant kindly mute your okay. audio stop your video stop your video requesting all participants kindly mute your audio and stop your video good evening everybody and we welcome you all back to amsi web series season 3 uh, we are very good. delighted to um, to have among us here today uh, we also have representatives from smile train we are thank thanks smile train for uh, participating with the msi web series uh, we also have president secretary treasurer and members of ilclpca with us today uh, the team requesting all participants kindly mute your audio and stop your video msi web series season 3 uh, Jaydeep and Siddharth, it's a, we are getting echo from YouTube. Please mute yourself. So we, are, we welcome you all back to AMSI web, se season, uh, web series season three. Um, the team web series team have came up with a new idea for this web series. Yeah, uh, what, what we have done uh, this time is to collaborate with uh, uh, other societies and uh, try to glow, uh, go global, as the uh, logo says, it's sans borders. So we are, in this particular session, we are, we are uh, collaborating with ISCPCA, that is the Indian uh, Cranio, uh, Left Lip and Palip and Cranial Patient Anomalies uh, Society. Uh, we are happy to have Dr. Uh, Atul Parashar, the secretary of uh, uh, ICLPCA with us. Atul. Atul. Hi, hi Atul. Everybody. Unmute you. All. Yeah. Atul, start your video, please. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I welcome you all. Thank you, Atul. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure working along with ILCLPCA. Welcome, Pritam, and this is the way forward. Thank you, Atul. Over to you, Amit. Yeah, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I, uh, I would like to introduce our YouTube co-host, Dr. Jaideep uh, Chauhan. He's a cleft and craniofacial surgeon. Jaideep, you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Jaideep, on your video, you want to say hello? Yeah. Can you see? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Siddharth Chatterjee. He's also one of our YouTube co-hosts. Dr. Siddharth. Okay. We have uh, four uh, Zoom co-hosts. Uh, Dr. Sunil Richardson. Hi. Dr. Sunil. Hi. We have a uh, speech pathologist, uh, Dr. Savita. Dr. Savita. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, looking forward to the wonderful evening ahead. Thank you, Dr. Savita. Dr. Vasanth is also one of our uh, Zoom co-hosts. Hi. 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 Hi, Dr. Vasanth. And uh, yeah, hi. We all hi, everybody. Know Dr. Pramod Subhash is all, also one of our, uh, one of our uh, Zoom co-hosts. Pramod. As a customer, no, I came in. I came in a little earlier. Thank you, Amit. Yeah. Over to you, Kanan. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the next initiative. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce the moderators for the day. As um, Pramod and Pritam said, it is a multidisciplinary, multi country international faculty we have. We have Dr. Mann, Robert Mann from the US. He's there with us early in the morning. Dr. Mann, do you want to say hello? Good morning. Thank you so much for having me participate. I'm really excited to see so many of my friends. Thank you very much. Very early. Thanks for joining us, William. Dr. Maria Mazzini, from, she's an orthodontist from the fashion city of Milano. Dr. Maria, do you want to say hi? Today is World Orthodontic Health Day. So we wish her on that. And Dr. Maria? Is it? <laughs> Hello from Milano. Not very fashionable right now, but um, I'm so glad to be 
somehow in India again. I love India and um, it is a pleasure to be here with you. I hope I'll be useful somehow. Thank you so much. We have someone who doesn't need that much introduction to the Indian audience who's been with us for a lot of times and who has taught us a lot of things, Dr. Nasser Nasser. Dr. Nasser, please say hi. Hi. To Great to um, meet such a wonderful audience uh, and it's good to be with all of you friends and I look forward to this great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Nasser. Uh, I have with and me my, my, sorry, excuse me. I have with me my colleague, my protege, uh, Mr. Ujam, who's my senior registrar and we've done a lot of work together, so he'll be with me. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have with us Dr. Mukund Reddy, one of the senior most uh, plastic surgeons who is, who is known for his cleft work and his excellent cleft work. Dr. Reddy, thank you for joining us. Do you want to say hi to the audience? Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure. It's a new way of meeting. So let's see how it goes. It's much more comfortable, I should say. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks for joining us and participating in this event. And last but not the least, our very own Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Mustafa Kader. So, do you want to Hi, say everyone. Hello? Hi. Thank you. Thank you. And over to Dr. Veerabhagu to introduce the moderator and yeah. start the proceedings. Hello, everyone. And yes, it's a pleasant duty for me to introduce my good friend and current immediate past president, Dr. Krishnamurti Banantaya, fondly called Dr. Kita. He's one of the few doubly qualified maxillofacial surgeons with a fellowship from UK practicing in India. He is also the current president of ISLPCA. After having worked in Manipal, Darwad, and Mangalore, he's currently heading the cleft unit in Jain Hospital, Bangalore. He has to his credit over 10,000 cleft surgeries and presented some original research papers. He has trained innumerable fellows from his units, and he is known for his fairy speech and oratorial skills. When he is not arguing for a title, he's a great moderator too. I fondly recall the rhinoplastic workshop he conducted at Darwa 20 years back with Dr. Professor Nazar, which I attended. Looking forward to a great session. Over to you, Dr. Krishnamurti. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, before you start. Yeah. Sir, be, yeah, before you start, sir, we'll run the AMSA web mu music, please, sir. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, sir. Praveen, you're ready? And we we'll also acknowledge. <laughs> Can I start, Pritam? Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this overwhelming response uh, uh, at a very short notice for this meeting, not only for those who are going to be the panelists, but also those in the audience. I see some very, very senior cleft surgeon uh, like Dr. Nitin Mokal already there in that group. So I, I think we are going to have a good time. I will try to be less fiery and oratorical. But um, uh, to introduce you, before we introduce uh, uh, you to the topic of the day, um, there's something that I wanted to say. Uh, we have now moved on. Uh, for those of you who are from India will know that the latest uh, uh, slogan for us is what is called as Atpa Nirbharate. So in other words, that is self-reliance. Uh, I have nothing against uh, going for Atma Nir becoming Atma Nirbhar, but I also have a small uh, request. While you want to become Atma Nirbhar, do not become a Koopa Manduk. So uh, we will start off. I will just give you some of the ground rules for what we are going to do uh, in this presentation. This is going to be basically a case-based uh, discussion with the masters. That's how we have planned it. 
So what I have done is I've picked up about uh, five different types of uh, cases that we encounter as cleft surgeons. And we will start discussing one case at a time. So the first case will be on uh, nasoalveolar molding. So we will have uh, two infants, one who, uh, with a unilateral cleft and another with a bilateral cleft, cleft newborn. These are all my cases just to start off as icebreakers. So we, the first segment or the first case discussion will be on nasoalveolar molding. We have uh, Maria Miazzini here from Milano. And if you just go and uh, look at the amount of publication that she has done, the long-term results that she has looked at, uh, it's phenomenal. And uh, we are lucky to have somebody like that with whom we can discuss various aspects of nasoalveolar molding. And we will also have the other viewpoint for many reasons when we cannot do nasoalveolar molding, uh, how to still get good results. Dr. Reddy will uh, help us do that. And the second case will be on a operated uh, cleft palate, a child uh, which I operated who has velopharyngeal incompetence. So initially I will provide the case record like uh, speech therapist perceptual assessment and so on. And then we have two of the real experts, I would say the classiest guys you can see who operate on velopharyngeal competence, incompetence, dysfunction anywhere in the world. One of them is Robert Mann. For those of you who haven't heard his name, he's a gentleman from Michigan who has probably done a lifetime's work of, on a completely new concept of treating cleft lip and palate. We are going to mainly focus on the use of buckle flap, et cetera, in velopharyngeal dysfunction. But Dr. Mann, over a period of two to three decades now, has, has enriched the, the practice of cleft lip and palate by bringing in this completely new element in primary repair of cleft lip and palate, i.e. the buckle flap, and what that has done to his patients in terms of speech, in terms of growth, have all been published as long-term results in PRS and other journals. But uh, I, I consider myself extremely lucky uh, to be sharing uh, this uh, discussion with him. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Mahan. And uh, Dr. Reddy, he's, he's one of the most innovative surgeons I have met. I would call him uh, a dronacharya. Fortunately, he never asked for Guru Dakshina. I still have both my thumbs with me. Uh, I have learned a huge amount of maxillof uh, cleft surgery. Sorry, that was a Freudian slip. Uh, I have learned a huge amount of cleft surgery from Dr. Reddy over the last decade or so without ever having to stand and watch him do it. Um, he is an innovative original surgeon, has his own uh, methodology for uh, treating velopharyngeal incompetence or dysfunction. So, so that will be the second case. And then the third and the fourth cases will be one of the consequences that we as cleft surgeons produce after we treat, uh, after we treat uh, children at a very early age. Uh, again, Dr. Miyazini has done some original research on causes for cleft maxillary hypoplasia. She has some lovely publications on that. She also has some dynamic uh, methodology to work on children who are still in their mixed or early permanent dentition period uh, to, to mitigate the effects of this maxillary hypoplasia. Uh, I have uh, heard her, I've read her papers, and if you have done, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions on that. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Mustafa here, who is like an all-rounder. Who, who can uh, uh, give uh, his uh, uh, rich experience on any of these case scenarios. A lot of them, as we go along with these cases, will share, uh, in addition to what uh, uh, cases I am showing, they're going to share a few videos, a few uh, tips and tricks and so on. Uh, and the last case will be on a unilateral and a bilateral cleft nose. You might have heard Nasser already saying, Nasser uh, is a man who's, uh, probably dedicated his life, uh, 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 though he was a very, very competent maxillofacial surgeon doing the whole spectrum, still, still does, but he's known as a, as a, as a rhinoplasty specialist. Uh, his forte was aesthetic rhinoplasty, so they say, but he has been <clears throat> assisting, helping me every year, come and operate with me for the last decade or so. I've seen him operate every year for the last quarter of a century, once a year in India. He's done yeoman service to the cause of uh, 
cleft children in this country and he is going to share his experiences as well so that's how we will go every after we finish the presentations or uh, the opinions from the panelists on each case we will have discussion and then move on i am told by the org uh, organizers not to be too much finicky about time so i hope all of you are relaxed and i hope you all enjoy after this very lengthy introduction so you will see the first presentation coming up right now okay so as i said nezo alvela molding uh dr miazini i want to start with you uh when you see a case like this what are your thoughts and how do you plan and in treating these uh, children okay i have on can you hear me yeah, yes we can hear um well generally as you know we we tend to do nasal velum molding in bilateral especially that's where we have most of our experience um we very seldom get children this late like with already teeth in but um at this stage i suppose this child is about 5 months 6 months uh, i guess sorry sorry uh, uh, that that's a mistake these are couple of neonatal teeth and uh, she's uh, oh. only yeah yeah she's only about 3 weeks old yeah. wow big neonatal yeah, I'm, teeth i'm sorry yeah i'm sorry no no that's yeah, great yeah 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 good interesting and i've we, never seen such big neonatal teeth we we don't do them beyond 6 weeks okay then then i would just start with um um regular nasal velar molding the way i do it it takes about uh, um i have a, uh, as i told you a short presentation whenever you want me to um share my screen uh, uh, on the way we do it you can do it now i can do you it can now do it. yeah this was just like an ice breaker you can do it now okay yeah we've broken the ice yes and there i go share can you see it uh, yes we can see it now So um regarding nasal velar molding um I liked very much the fact that um you put it as a very um important aspect to talk about and to discuss about because there is still a lot of controversy and it's important to talk about it with people that do it and don't um so we're still in that period of time when we really want to make fantasy facts and the other thing that i liked very much is that you divided unilaterals from bilaterals because i think they are completely different issues bilaterals need to do something so you need to reduce the protrusion of that premaxilla and in many centers also in italy they tend to do lip adhesion and now given the fact that there are right now four big randomized studies trying to understand whether um neonatal anesthesia done too many times in the first year of life can give neurotoxicity whatever we can do to avoid extra surgery in my opinion is is definitely important so what we used to do um i'm talking before before 1999 more or less was just using a passive plate and the tape get the premaxilla back and then professor brusatti would do his beautiful lip the problem was of course a flat nose and no columella now uh, remember that more or less 93 94 95 was a time when everybody was starting to talk about primary surgery on the nose of bilateral children and within the very many techniques um professor brusatti liked very much certain aspects he had seen the results of the um group in new york and he liked the shape of those noses very very much um when you start something when you don't have any evidence um i as you know uh, very um much into trying to do something that has evidence when there is no evidence you have to make it so what we thought was okay we'll start because 
we know for sure from the evidence from the Dutch people that there is no inhibition or at least definitely not as a Latham appliance given <coughs> by the plate itself. Uh, but then you get this huge tissue expansion, which was what appealed to Professor Ruzzati that much. Um, so you could stretch those tissues. I'm not sure if we could get the columella from the nose into uh, so getting it out, but you could get a nice proportion columella compared to the length of the base of the nose with the philtrum is in a good position. We never exaggerated in terms of retracting the premaxilla because um, we are not doing any primary gingival violoplasty. We do it only secondarily, so at two, two, two and a half years of age. Um, so basically you could, just to show you laterally, uh, this is a length of columella you can get the position of the filtrum and then Professor Brosati would, would close, would, would do his surgery. Of course, what is more important to me is not what you get immediately, but what you get long term. So initially what we did was taking our five year old children and seeing their, what they looked like, how they grew compared to a group of non cleft children. These are my children. So what I Took was a bunch of classmates of my children, uh, did photometry on them, and then compare the group of the new uh, nasal violar molding group, group of the old um, technique from Professor Bruzzati, from, and then compare it to the classmates of my children. And what we saw, just to give you very, very rapidly the results, you can read the papers if you wish, is that the length of the columella was actually uh, not different from a non-cleft child. And especially if you look at it from underneath, so the proportion of the columella um, relative to the length of the base of the nose. A disadvantage that we still saw, so a big difference here, I've put um, purposely a girl with a very wide no nostrils, is that on average, these nostrils were wide and still are wide. But if you look at the literature, um, Mullikin's study at five years of age shows even wider noses and even wider, wider tips of the nose, actually, in, in his cases. So we went on because I think five is not enough. You want to know what happens afterwards. So we looked at the children in adolescence. I have three children. Adolescence is a very tough time. So what we did was, again, pick up these children, compare uh, to this is my daughter on the right side at five and at 13. And this is one of our patients at five and at 13. We did the same measurements. Uh, this is actually my son, just to show you, look at how much the columella grows compared to the rest of the nose, which is what you want to see in your own patients. So what we saw was actually this happens. Uh, the columella in a child who's done this technique keeps on growing faster than the rest of the nose and maintains a normal proportion with a non-cleft nose. It does in e either direction, but it stays wide. Um, I'll just show you some of the oldest children who are 19, 20 now. Um, they're not perfect noses, but they have not been touched till now. Some of them will want to be touched. But till now, these are all untouched noses, not, not perfect, but untouched. Look at this other boy. Look at the asymmetry that was present initially. Um, with, with surgery, it seemed less asymmetrical, but it becomes very evident with growth. Another case followed till 19. It, is, it was a wide nose to start with. It keeps on being wide, but the columella does grow nicely. And another case at 17 years with a nice growth of the columella. So what we do have is not evidence because this is not a randomized study, but we have at least long-term clinical experience. So I, I think that's what I wanted to explain very briefly. And then I have something on unilaterals. So yeah, so, so Maria, we will go on to unilateral a little later. So yes, let me take so the stopped. opinion from the other panelists and on this one, and then we go to the unilateral in a minute. Excellent. Shall I, shall I uh, un yeah. unshare? Yeah. Where is unshare it? and yes, I think uh, uh, Dr. Mann has a presentation. So I just check with him which one he has. And uh, so, so we, we had this uh, interesting 
quite a long-term study of someone who has been doing nasoalveolar molding for bilateral cleft lips. But I would also like to hear from others, uh, starting with Bob. Uh, uh, Bob, uh, your presentation is on the bilateral cleft lip or unilateral, or it's a combined one. Uh, it's just a comment on uh, on okay. how I use how I sure. use it. Sure. So let's have that presentation, Bob, and then we can take the questions and talk to the other panelists later. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Go on. Okay. <clears throat> And it's not advancing. Why is that? Yeah. So uh, my my thoughts in this is going to be we've got these cases, and what I'm going to do is in each case is I'm going to describe the philosophy that I use, which is different than traditional philosophy, and uh, and that will show people how. I make decisions as to what I do to get the results. So I want to start off by first, you know, when you're starting to raise, when you raise a child, it's incredibly important to help your child get off to the right start. And the same can be true in cleft care. There are many paths that we can travel. There's lots of different care options, but each child has their own shortest path to success. Some children, it might be one small case. Others, it might be that there's multiple cases to get them to that success point. But the very first treatments that we do will definitely define the path for that child for the rest of their lives. So I, I ask everybody today to think about what is your particular cleft reconstructive philosophy and what resources do you have? Because these are the two things which are going to define how you decide what you're going to do for your patients. If we look at the traditional repair reconstruction philosophy we've all been trained with, we bring the maxillary tissue together, what's that, whatever's there, we pull it together, and then we rearrange the soft tissue of the soft palate muscles, etc. And this philosophy, uh, the intent of it has always been to close everything in one step. We try to close our lips in one step, we try to close our palates in one step. And that's been the philosophy that we all work under. And if you look at what we do, that is what it is. You can see that certainly pulling things together over time, you can see the narrowing of the arches, you can see the, the collapse that we still get today, and this even the present, you'll see these types of things, especially in places that don't have the, the marvelous ass, uh, orthodontic support. And we see children like this today uh, all the time. We're going to show other cases, the dish face and the early collapse of the face, which has huge impact on the people. And some people think that this is pathognomonic of the cleft deformity, that this is just what's going to happen. And I hope today to show that that's not the case as well. So you'll have people like this, that if they don't have a, a dish face, but they have speech problems, they're going to have problems because a mouth breather is going to lose their teeth. And it really doesn't matter about their, their uh, a bite if they're losing their teeth because they're a mouth breather and they're still suffering from obstructive sleep apnea. This is the son of the gentleman I just showed you. I took care of him thinking I was doing a great job. And 19 years later, I'm dealing with the same issues of the mid face protrusion. So maybe is today the day that we change our cleft philosophy? Um, I think it's always reasonable to consider new things. The anatomic cleft restoration, I used to call it the buckle flap approach, but it's, I use it in all aspects, lip repair as well. Diagnose and replace missing tissue. Individualize your reconstructive planning. Don't use the same operation for everybody. Sound wound healing, and then allow the muscles to be in their natural position. That is the essence of what I think about in every aspect. And the, the most important thing is as clefts go from simple to complex, more and more tissue is effectively missing. So that's where I get known as a buckle flap because a buckle flap is a wonderful tissue replacement tool and they can't replace everything. Obviously the muscles can't be replaced. Now looking at pre-surgical alveolar molding as well as nasal uh, uh, molding, which I think are two distinctly different things. This is uh, Shelley Rosenstein's work with us in, that I was 
trained with, with uh, Dr. Rosenstein, and you could shape the alveolus. There's uh, the Ralph Latham, and I worked with Ralph for uh, many years early on in my career, and he, he could uh, move these pallets around, and uh, this was also associated with early gingival periosteoplasties, as is nasal alveolar molding in many cases. I think that we need to look at two types of clefts. We have the collapsed clefts, which you see here. These are children whose segments have fallen together even before the lips and palates are repaired. Here, alveolar molding is very important because if you see a collapsed cleft, if you just pull that together, you are starting these children off on the wrong path and they will never be able to get their face out to appropriate balance. So here you can see I've added tissue so that when orthodontically we want to expand them like an accordion, it's easy to do. These are the expanded clefts. Here we can bring the alveolus somewhat together, but we don't want to overcorrect, otherwise we're pinching the face. You want to bring them into this type of balance. So that is what I would use alveolar molding and uh, nasal alveolar molding for. But for most of my patients that look like this, I can show you long-term results like this without necessarily having to have a uh, uh, using nasal alveolar molding. So here's another example. You can get good occlusion without having to use it in the unilateral case. Uh, and so this is another example, long-term. So we see these kids uh, all over 16 years of age and often into their 30s. But there's an example uh, that, that we've just described and I agree completely using it in this type of a, a case, but because uh, this is what you're going to often see, though, if you do an early gingival plasty. But not all my bilaterals do I use it. Here's a child now who's 16 years of age, and you can see he has a very nice occlusion, good facial balance, uh, excellent speech with just his uh, normal treatment. So adding buckle flaps allows the arch to have more of a width to it, especially in the posterior, which I think any orthodontist is gonna be much happier working with these types of arches. And uh, it's all about how you start them off. So thank you very much. And so I, it's a wonderful tool. I think once again, with resources, uh, it's not available to everybody, but I think in the, especially the bilaterals, it's a very important tool. Right. Uh, uh... Thank you, Dr. Mann, for uh, uh, coming out with your alternative views on, on when and where to use uh, some kind of uh, alveolar molding. So I'll, I'll, I'll move along now, uh, uh, sticking to the same uh, bilateral cleft. So there seems to be, uh, as far as nasoalveolar molding goes, there seems to be uh, a uh, consensus, more or less, that there are certain bilateral clefts that require alveolar molding or nasoalveolar molding. I think uh, I was speaking to uh, Dr. Reddy in the morning and he, he did say that as well. Uh, but there seems to be also an opinion that uh, in unilateral clefts, it may or may not be so essential. So before we go on to the unilateral cleft, I want to bring in Dr. Mustafa. Dr. Mustafa, are you with us? Dr. Mustafa. Yeah, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. I'm here. Just me. Can uh, you hear me yeah, now? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so already we have a, a, a little bit of a controversy here as to uh, whether we need to do this alveolar molding in all cases. So, before I go on to the bilateral cleft lip, uh, I'll ask you a simple question. In your experience and opinion, would both unilateral and bilateral uh, cleft lips? Uh, we are not talking about the marginal ones, but but more severe ones. Would both Unilateral and bilateral clefts require nasoalveolar molding, as you uh, see it? Yeah, I, I agree with the statement you just made before you address me. I would be more concerned uh, doing uh, a nasoalveolar molding, particularly for a bilateral case, than in a unilateral case. I think, uh, by and large, the bilateral cases would require nasoalveolar molding because of the problem of a protruding premaxilla. If you don't address it, the results will get severely compromised. So uh, uh, my, my take on that is uh, unilateral, even if they uh, come at a later date without uh, uh, doing an isoalveolar molding, we can manage it to a large extent, but that's not the same case with the bilateral. 
Okay, so 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 it, there seems to be emerging a consensus that Dr. Reddy, will you agree with that? That bilaterals are the ones where there may be an indication, but unilateral not so much. Is that uh, is that what your your opinion is as well? Can I share something? Or yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. So uh, yeah. Um, yes, sir. You you are you are, you are, you, are, you, are, you were sharing the screen earlier. Yes. Now we don't have it. Uh, Uh, no, anyway, uh, what uh, I was doing before uh, natural alveolar molding uh, came on uh, in the picture is actually to operate, uh, uh, like Robert Mann said, I was closing everything in one go. Because right. his, uh, his ideas changed my view. Right now, I do pallet uh, with buckle flap to maintain the arch. Uh, um, but uh, in a country like India, we get patients about three months of age very frequently. It is more often than not that we get patients where you cannot do nasalveolar molding because they are over age. So we are sort of forced to do these cases without nasalveolar molding. But nasalveolar molding is most useful in case of bilateral cleft because it gets the, makes the surgery a little easier. But then, look at the results which I have obtained in the past. Uh, they are acceptable, even though they are more difficult on the surgeon. The ultimate results, as far as the lip scar and the nose goes, is more than acceptable. Right, right, sir. So, uh, so, so we go back to Maria. Uh, Maria, I think you are listening to what the surgeons are saying. Uh, so there is an opinion that uh, that uh, this is something which may be very may be useful in bilateral but not necessary, and in the unilateral not so much. Uh, do you have a counterpoint to that, or you agree with them? I I actually um, till uh, four years ago was completely in in accordance. Like I thought and actually that's part of the sharing that I have in the next couple of slides um, till a few years ago I did not do any nasoviolar molding and unilaterals because I thought it was useless basically it all depended on the surgeon uh, recently actually now I'm I, maybe I'll share the screen yes yes sure yeah, maybe go ahead. I think we've come to that point where we go on to the unilateral yeah yeah, or do on. you want me to talk about bilaterals first? No, 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 no. You go on. Whatever okay. you were going to show, why? Uh, yeah, we have done with the bilaterals now. Yeah. Okay. So, because what what I was telling you right now is um, when I can I, does it go forward? No. Yes. When I was in Chicago, so after my, my years in Boston and in Boston with Mullican, we used only um, Latham, um, the Latham appliance and no nasal, nasal molding. Um, when I was in Chicago with um, Dr. Figueroa and Dr. Polly, we used uh, nasal viola molding. So this is a child that was operated in Chicago. So I had my training quite early on because we're talking 1996. But when I came back to Italy in 1997, and then this is for ex just one example of Professor Rosati's noses. And I was looking at them and thinking, well, they are so symmetrical without me wasting my time, which is so underpaid and wasting the patient's time that I, I was quite convinced. And we discussed a lot. It was nice with Professor Rosati because there was a lot of discussion. So um, we, together decided that it really didn't make much sense to do nasal molding. Uh, more than alveolar, we're talking nasal molding uh, in this case in, in unilaterals. Then a, a few years ago, and what we were doing with was basically having a passive plate and getting not, a, not necessarily this close. Very often we would leave some, some space, uh, just um, reduce the, uh, the, the width of the palate and the width of the cleft, of the oak, the oak cleft, but not completely necessarily, and just using a very passive plate. So very simple patients would come in 
every five to six weeks, not too much hassle for the families and not too much hassle for me. Then um, I kept on seeing these papers, but they were all coming out from the same New York group. So I wasn't really convinced. And uh, all of a sudden, then when Professor Kuzati stopped working and Dr. Oteritano started, he's been working quite a lot with Dr. Philip Chen uh, from Taiwan, who's now in mainland China. And he has started again, emphasizing the importance of uh, molding that nose before um, surgery also in unilaterals. So that's the first case that we did together with Dr. Alteritano. So I did my molding. Um, it, of course, when you see it, right, the before and, and the after the molding, you think um, it might be easier for the surgeon, but I don't have any evidence whatsoever right now. So the result was definitely very symmetrical. Um, possibly even better than some of the patients that Professor Rosati um, used to do. Um, but what we decided a few years ago, so you're not going to see any long-term results. I, I never talk before I have at least five years of results, but we've started a prospective, it, it's a semi-randomized study. So we are um, doing on the children that um, live sort of close enough to be able to come once every four weeks or that whose parents accept to do it, we're doing uh, alveolar molding, nasal molding um, in unilaterals, like in this child. We try to overcorrect, like uh, Dr. Philip Chen says, uh, and, and really symmetry, get, give a good symmetry to um, the, um, uh, the mm, philtrum and, and, and the nose. But I will give you the results of what we have at least not before four to five years from now. So this is just um, showing you that we are doing it now. We're trying to study it properly. For the time being, the only randomized study that I've ever seen is yours. So Christian Murti, Murti's yeah. study. So you are the only one who can make science at this point in time. So I think I'll just um, unshare right. here because yeah, then- so, yeah. Sure. Thanks, Maria. Uh, uh, commenting on what you have already said, uh, we already have data of five-year-olds, uh, NAM and no-NAM. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, we have done both objective measurements as well as uh, ASHA Mectate subjective. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. We are writing it up. Uh, that's all I'll say now. Yes, we have, though we haven't randomized them. They, they came in randomized, meaning whoever came in in the first six weeks, we, we did the uh, nasal alveolar molding and the older ones like Dr. Reddy was saying we have done no NAM for them. So yes, the, those results will come up. But I also have, want to get Dr. Mustafa back on these unilateral clefts. He, he made an in, interesting observation to me uh, this morning that, uh, and I think I, you were saying that to me earlier on at U Utrecht, that when you do nasal alveolar molding, if you do not do a primary rhinoplasty of some kind, your results are not likely to be uh, stable or, or the best you can get. So I don't think we will play the video, Dr. Musavavi. I think we are running a little late, but can you give us your jam on uh, your approach in a child where you've already done nasal alveolar molding yeah. uh, in a unilateral? Uh, yeah. Uh, What's your am, surgical yeah, approach? Yeah, I am all for doing a nasal alveolar molding. You know, uh, if I get a chance, uh, I would do it, even if it is a late. If it's a little late, if I get the child, I will still continue to do it. The reason is, whatever little symmetry that uh, you would achieve is always beneficial. Now, having said that, uh, uh, part of the problem is uh, uh, not just aligning this lower lateral cartilage, uh, which is done with the help of NAM, because there are a few issues that I have noticed. Uh, the, the problems are what is called as the optimal NAM result, which is a very difficult thing uh, in our center to assess and say, where do we stop? So what is the so optimal results, number one. Number two, there are also other variabilities which are not in our control. For example, one is what, what is that I already mentioned. The second one is uh, whether uh, they are wearing the appliance consistently because that is not under our control. So very often, uh, these are the issues that we confront with. 
and uh, we have also done a few observations which i can uh, uh, if you allow me to do that little presentation uh, i you want me to avoid the video i'll avoid the video yeah no so no uh, i just want you to explain your philosophy uh, because yeah. i think we are running very late now we are yeah. still on the first case so we haven't okay. we, we may have a lot of audience questions so if okay. you can tell me your philosophy of what you do when you operate on these children yeah because so that's even important if, for us yeah today. yeah even if they would have uh, undergone the nasal alveolar molding i i initially started doing an uh, open rhinoplasty that means i used to raise the columellar flap now of lately i don't do an open rhinoplasty but i do a semi open rhinoplasty in either of these instances the the premise is that you are able to physically reorient the displaced lower lateral cartilage so that is uh, that is the whole idea behind it and i found it uh, it's much more uh, 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 less time consuming when you do a semi open rhinoplasty because if you want to check the symmetry symmetry the skin is already intact the columellar skin uh, so you are able to check the symmetry quite easily unlike raising a columellar flap because if you want to see uh, check the symmetry you have to put the flap back again check it so this is much more a simpler technique uh, you can just put a rim incision expose the cartilage remove the fibro fatty tissue if required and uh, put interdermal stitches or maybe an additional stitch to the upper lateral cartilage so uh, mustafa that presentation that you have these okay. are pictures of uh, uh, of yeah, these uh, yeah. open rhinoplasty I, I, okay. I, so I, you, I, you put them on you put them yeah, on fine. and then fine. i will start taking questions uh, while sure. you're getting ready sure, okay sure. so sure. Uh, so we have a, a short presentation from mustafa uh, you I'm can there. start sharing the screen yeah so yeah, yeah, uh, i now screen? request yeah you can you can just quickly run through this presentation yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. we will take questions on uh, on uh, nasal okay. alveolar molding okay now Next. this is this is one case she came a little late maybe at uh, one and a half months two months my orthodontist tried uh, doing uh, the nasal alveolar molding but the results were not quite optimal and uh, we did uh, the kiloplasty with uh, a semi open rhinoplasty so this is one example okay uh that's the symmetry that we were able to achieve here is another the, case the, the semi open sorry to interrupt yeah. you the yeah, semi open yeah. is a tajima incision on the cleft side a rim incision no, on the non cleft no, side no no uh, rim incision on both the sides okay marginal or rim incision on incision both the on sides both the, okay yeah, yeah, and yeah. then yeah okay yeah okay Go now on, even on, even 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 this case okay even this case uh didn't undergo nam didn't go under nam at all and uh, this is the kind of symmetry and uh, we have been able to achieve and the symmetry is quite consistent because uh this we have the post operative result for 2 years and 3 months so these are the results that i would substantiate whatever uh, that i have done so far okay long term results are yet to be you know checked okay i won't play the video oh. Yeah, the next, yeah. We'll the next. we'll move on now. No, I have yeah, one more so, thing to show. One more one more thing okay. to show. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is one case where NAM was done. You can see the changes after the NAM. You can see that. Then post kiloplasty. Okay. We have achieved some symmetry. Uh, look at it at four months. And uh, see, this is what my orthodontist has done. See the changes. But you can see after post surgically four months. Now we have it. it is slightly reverting back you can see some amount of asymmetry that is setting so that is the uh, nostril uh, uh, opening that we have been able to reproduce so here is another case and this is something which i want to tell you uh, and the audience that of lately for uh, some mild cases we use this uh, what is called as a uh, mu hook it's a manipal university hook rather than the traditional appliance so that's what we did for this child and look at the post uh, kiloplasty result you can see there is some amount of collapse and uh, I, what i did is i went ahead though it was an incomplete lip i went ahead and uh, did a semi open rhinoplasty but what we subsequently realized in this case when we did all the measurements from the base of the columella on the cleft side to the base of the to the lr base and what we found out is there was there may have been a possibility of a mega nostril or an over molding that could have happened that's why you see the symmetry when you when we finished off with the lip repair which i was compelled to go ahead and do the uh, uh, 
semi open rhinoplasty so that's okay. it uh, i have nothing else okay, to add thank you. Uh, that that's uh, that's the uh, diagrammatic representation one to one on a photograph what we have got this is what we have at two months right thank you so so at this point of time we have seen uh, some um, very different opinions and uh, how uh, we work on noses um, uh, in children uh, i think uh, we have taken a lot of time on this one i'm a little worried about this however uh, if uh, uh, sunil and uh, wasant have questions from the audience we will take it before we move on to the second case sunil and wasant yeah uh, just uh, there are... questions on nasal alveolar molding please don't bring up any other things so that we don't get confused okay yeah, wasant yeah a uh, few questions yeah. on uh, bilateral clefts and nasal alveolar molding uh, okay. one one question is uh, how do you manage the nose agenesis uh, when there is no columella or the nasal septum in bilateral clefts okay. okay anything on nasal alveolar molding we'll come to this in a minute uh, anything yeah, that uh, uh, pertains to nasal alveolar molding yeah the, the, there is one the, question, question here Am I audible? Go on. Yes, you are, Sunil. Go on. So they want to know if the patient comes at let's say three months, would they send the patient for NAM or surgery? Right. So uh, I will take this question because I I don't think uh, Dr. Miyazini has that experience often. So so in 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 our unit and in many other units that I know, uh, four to six week is the time till when uh, we will start doing nasal alveolar molding, uh, but. what is the experience of our orthodontist is that beyond that time it's difficult to do particularly alveolar molding so today anybody who comes in at beyond 2 or 3 months and if there is a significant pre maxillary protrusion we would just uh, try lip taping and for the nose itself for both bilateral and unilateral uh, we are doing the nasal hooks as shown by mustafa rather than doing nasal alveolar molding you are just doing a nasal molding and uh, i have found that on table when when i'm operating uh, the, the architecture of the nose itself i can't see much difference between a nam treated and a nasal hook treated uh, case so in other words when you do this nasal hooks only when they come later on they seem to be giving good results but i don't have any data this is just anecdotal of observance of doing a number of those cases but we will we will have them soon so the bottom line is there is an option of using nasal hooks along with uh, taping uh, instead of doing uh, alveolar molding at after 3 months of age yeah any more questions yeah. on this there, or there is there, yeah. there is another question on the unilateral uh, yeah. the, the the question is regarding the length of the columella size and are we getting any difference in the columella sense size uh, uh, after surgery with yeah. or without length hand. of the length length of the columella the, post surgery the on the cleft side yes unilateral uh, uh, dr dr miyazini do you want to answer that are you getting a increase in the hemi columella length after nam and surgery in unilateral uh considering that till now we're at 16 18 patients so not not a high number um, and yeah. usually unilaterals don't have such a huge deficiency in columella length what what you see is more of a, an amazing straightening so right. once it straightens you of course you notice it more but you're not really lengthening it the way that you see in bilaterals but but what i was noticing also from dr mustafa's beautiful work um what his orthodontist doesn't do is overcorrection what we've been taught by philip chen is in unilaterals especially to overcorrect and so you have to have that that um columella completely straight and the nostril the affected nostril much higher than the unaffected one of course trying not to create a mega nostril right so, thank you maria so i i fully agree with you our numbers uh, show that the columella gets quite straight and in fact Uh, i see the septum also more or less straight uh, I, i have not collected data on this but the columella angle becomes more or less close to the normal uh, noses at the end of nam right so uh, uh, any more questions on on this wasant uh, sunil there's some yeah. questions from youtube if it can be taken through okay. the yes, whatsapp yes, please yes yes uh, okay pramod or wasant 
yeah pramod or whatsapp pramod or vasan can can i can i can i yes, ask a question so, sir it might i can see yes, sir. i can see the i can see the whatsapp here uh, jaydeep's questions right uh, i can i can ask that uh, yes sir if I, if i miss out something you can tell me well, this question is to mustafa do you use post operative nasal conformers in all cases yes. dr mustafa okay. yeah can you can you hear me yeah can you hear, can you hear me kita yes yes we can yes, hear yes, you go yes. on Uh, by and large the answer is yes uh, and the reason is uh, whatever results that you have achieved on table be it uh, closed nasal dissection with nam without nam or an uh, uh, open uh, dissection like how i do that is the semi open which i have been doing predominantly now it is always good to use a conformer so that you can maintain those results for a longer period of time taking into account that the lower lateral displaced lower lateral cartilage has a memory and it tends to go back to its previous position so that being the case uh, when you have physically reoriented it and supported with the uh, nasal stent or a nasal conformer as you may call it uh, that will uh, give you a better stability in the long run and i would use Thanks. it minimum for around 6 months thank you thank you dr mustafa yeah i, I want to echo his uh... uh sentiments on this one uh, we have uh, struggled a bit to uh, find them all the time but we use it as much as possible i listened to uh, jean claude palma uh, in the utrecht cleft meeting last year and uh, uh, he said that the, the relapse by mm -hmm. the scar contracture that takes place immediate post surgery is what can be prevented by using nasal conformers i think we have spent a lot of time uh, on 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 uh, on uh, nasal alveolar molding will yeah just yeah. one comment one comment sure. the sure. the marginal incision is a circular incision circular incisions right. contract what you're doing right. with your with your conformer is preventing that circular contraction i don't think it okay. does a dam to the cartilage it's the contraction okay. of the soft tissue yeah. this is what i heard from this is what i heard from talma as well that he thought that it was the soft tissue contraction which can be prevented it can be held in its place rather than yeah that's what i heard so we let's let's go on move on to the next uh, next one now because um, we are running short of time so those were all my results we don't have time to show them let's move on so here is uh, ryan i uh, he is 5 uh, uh, or 6 years old and uh, i will just uh, request uh, pravin to play the video pravin Sixty-four, sixty-five, sixty-six, sixty-seven, sixty-eight, sixty-nine, seventy, ninety-two hundred, ninety, ninety-one, ninety-two. Robin, you can stop. Robin, you can stop. So, so that is uh, that is the video. I mean, uh, that is the speech. I also want you to uh, see his. Uh, video fluoroscopy pravin can you play that next next video uh, the video fluoroscopy one oh sorry before we do that i will just also show you the perceptual speech assessment we use the universal parameters for speech everywhere it's different it's very simple here the the speech including intelligibility and acceptability are graded as 0 1 2 3 where 0 is normal and 3 is the worst and with him with ryan his speech was a uh, 3 his intelligibility was 3 very severe hard to understand most of the time speech uh, were normal deviating from normal to a severe degree with significant hypernasality so i'll just play his uh, uh, um, video fluoroscopy that we done pre operatively can we have that second video yeah. 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 okay so that was the video fluoroscopy of uh, that uh, ryan now i'll show you uh, simply what that video fluoroscopy gave us as data uh, just uh, the data that we got out of that video fluoroscopy so the perceptual species assessment is very severe or very poor speech and uh, that is what we saw so we we do measure uh, the what we call as the resting gap 
the velar gap and the velar excursion and uh, calculate the closure ratio one being complete closure so if you had velo pharyngeal competence the the closure will be one in his case it was found to be 0.25 which is a very severe uh, velo pharyngeal dysfunction so before i go to the uh, experts i will just finish off Uh, what i wanted to show and then we will go on to dr man and uh, dr uh, reddy so uh, can we have the next two videos please uh, uh, pravin so this was we did a conventional furlos palatoplasty for him and uh, this is the post post furlos post speech therapy results play the videos please pravin video number 3 and 4 Ravin, can you hear me? Video number three and four. Sixty-three, sixty-four, sixty-five, sixty-six, sixty-seven, sixty-eight, sixty-nine, seventy. Ninety-two hundred, ninety-nine. Ninety, ninety-one, ninety-two, Okay, play the next video. So that is his post speech therapy. Sixty two, sixty three, sixty four, sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty nine. Yeah. So that is uh, post furlos palatoplasty. Post. So now what he has is sorry about this back and forth because we are sharing screens a number of times. We couldn't find any better method of doing this. So now post the furlos palatoplasty, you saw the videos. Now he's got a resting gap of two millimeters, a velar gap that is zero. In other words, he's got complete closure. So not only has the resting gap reduced, but his velar movements have reduced, and he's able to close. This is after a secondary furlos palatoplasty. Uh, I now request uh, uh, Bob Mann to tell us how he will treat cases like this. Bob. Bob, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, you can share your screen and. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Um, yes. Well, uh, once again, looking at how I do things, uh, uh, it, we're going to talk about uh, the early path, uh, anatomic, the restoration concept will reduce our VPD, which is what we want to do when we think about prevention. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a vaccine for COVID before we got to this point? So. I think you know everybody knows about using buckle flaps. I really want to emphasize using them primarily. I'm going to go through this super fast because one of the things that we see is we want to get the best speech results, so we have the fewest secondary surgeries. So uh, our speech results that we can get utilizing this, showing comparing the narrow with the wide clefts, that we got. exact same results in fact the, the wider clefts got on percentage wise better speech but statistically they were the same so now we can get the same good speech results at 93.4% in all cases across the board so looking at our non syndromic patients these are patients i did using traditional repairs how was i doing well 19% needed speech surgery But when we look at it in more detail, looking at the threes and fours, how many reached normal speech? Well, only 47% because 53% needed speech surgery. These are the groups that are falling into this category of secondary speech. So using the anatomic palate restoration concept at the beginning, only 6.8% needed speech. So we're seeing a, a lot better speech result versus the traditional repair. So once again, now we're presented with this where you're going to use a primary repair and then you're going to do a pharyngeal flap or sphincterplasty. It's fantastic to see a repalatoplasty being done with a furlough and getting an excellent result. And that certainly would be one of the things that fits into the concept because a rearrangement is the first step up from the reconstructive ladder. But traditional approaches with the pharyngeal flaps, this creates huge airway resistance and what we don't want is long term sleep apnea we don't want to have these people have 20 to 25 years shorter lifespan so that's why we want to have a normal functioning velum and the repalatoplasty just shown allows that to happen 
this is the algorithm that we use, either repalatoplasty uh, as shown or a palatal sir, I think the screen is different. Bob, yeah. Mugun no, sir different... will have to, uh, sir will have to stop sharing screen. Yeah. Dr. Mukun, can you stop sharing? I think your presentation oh, has come in. I didn't realize it is gone. Yeah. Wait, sir. So, so once it finishes, then, yeah. Uh, just wait as we... Uh, uh, so, Praveen, Bob, can you... There's a different thing on it. Praveen. Yeah. yeah. So, can we go back? Uh, I think uh, we missed on some of those slides, I think, Bob. I'm sorry. Bob, can you go backwards? Yeah, okay. Is that about where we were? Yeah, yeah. So this is very important because with the pharyngeal flap or sphincterplasty, you don't have a very active ve uh, velar muscle engine. And so what we want with the repalatoplasty, like a Z-plasty, that's this still part is still functioning. And so this is my algorithm where I'll do either repalatoplasty if a buccal flap has been used or a Z-plasty or a palatal lengthening procedure. I also do what I call a palatal suspension, which I haven't published yet. I'm not gonna have time to talk about that today, but this is a salvage procedure that still maintains a normal anatomy before we get to these type of uh, operations we don't wanna use anymore. So the palatal lengthening procedure, a lot of people are familiar with, it takes two buccal flaps, one to replace the tensor vili palatini apneurosis and one to replace the, the missing mucous membrane. So I look at my secondary speech surgeries and say, okay, why aren't they speaking? Did I underestimate the amount of tissue that's necessary? Can I get it by just doing a rearrangement like a Z-plasty that was shown? Or do I need even more tissue? So here's an example of that where you've got a short palate and an older child. And when we release it, and allow the vellum to go to its natural velar position, there's quite a gap there. So we're gonna fill this with two buccal flaps, one on the nasal side and one on the oral side to literally double the length of the palate, adding almost two centimeters. And I always tell it looks like a, like a sausage early on and over time as the muscles activated actually gets more round in configuration. So how does that work? Well, here's a short video showing a Z-plasty case that I did. And this, uh, oops, that just completely quit. Excuse me. Here we go. So you can see you, you release not just on the oral side, you can think, think that's a lot of relaxing, but you really, when you release it on the nasal side, you get even more relaxation of where that vellum needs to be to have anatomic closure. This operation takes about, uh, about an hour and a half to two hours to do. So I did the Z-plasty, the child had a good repair, but then when he uh, reached, uh, six or seven, his speech needed to be improved. And so we did this operation. Here's your buckle flap, prodded duct outlined. If the buckle flap is different than the FAM flap, the facial artery myomucosal flap has the artery in it. That has its axis of rotation about in this location and it doesn't go all the way down here. So it's not as useful and it's very difficult flap to raise. Uh, this can be raised in about seven minutes, but the fam flap takes a lot longer to raise. This is very reproducible. Now, why did I emphasize doing the use of the buckle flaps in the primary if I might need them in the secondary? Well, two reasons. Number one, you're going to get that great speech results I showed you at 93% plus. And second, the complications that I have in the primaries are a lot smaller than in secondaries. The buccal flap loss that I have had, the major buccal flap has all been in this operation. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that children are older, they're less compliant uh, than the infants. Um, 
there's lots of reasons, but it just seems if we can get, once again, started in the right path, they do better. This is a good salvage operation, but the percentage of success is not as high uh, in, in this operation. It's, it's, it's higher than a pharyngeal flap in the, high, in the 80s of achieving normal success uh, and normal speech, but I still think it's best to use them early because you can uh, shift them if you need to get length. And I could show you the, how to do a repalatoplasty, but we don't have time for that today. But you can see the buckle flaps. We're gonna raise it on this side, slightly different view. And it's very important not to uh, cross over the retromolar area or you can get uh, a scarring in that area. So this, I loop it over that area. Uh, you can see that area down in here. I, there's a loop that I go over and that's what I divide. So the one flap is set in to replace the tensor villi palatini aponeurosis. You can see that put in here. And uh, the second flap is looped over the top. You can see now that's the outline of the tissue we've added. And then we flip this into the other side and it's sewn in place like that. It doesn't have to go all the way across and if you get a little bit past the midline, actually, it'll still work. And then a loose closure of your donor site is very important. You can see here's almost a two centimeter lengthening. There's the donor site. Sometimes in the older kids, their teeth, especially if the molars, six years or six year molars are coming in, they can bite the base of the flap. So you may need to put a splint in place. So repalatoplasty, I'll just show super quick. If you've used a buckle flap, you can move it to a new position. So I'm going to lift this up. I'm going to release it and I'm going to rotate that buckle flap in place. And it does, it, it does amazingly well. It, once again, uh, we don't have to do this very often, fortunately. So I think I'm going to stop right there and uh, take any questions. Right. Uh, uh, so, Bob, we'll take questions after the uh, Dr. Reddy's presentation. So he has yes, sir. his approach. So, yeah. So we have now seen uh, a, a routine palatoplasty, that, a case of which I showed. We saw the revolutionary Bob Mann technique. Remember, he does it for primary palate repairs, and he showed that his velopharyngeal incompetence rate, dysfunction rate is only about 5 to 6 percent. And then now we saw what we can do in the secondary situation. Now we will have Dr. Reddy, uh, his approach to a case like what I showed. So, Dr. Mukund Reddy, sir, you can start. Yeah. I'm just uh, trying to share yes, this. Sir. It's on the screen now. Yeah, it's on the screen. Yes, right. sir, you can go on. You can play the video. See, we had earlier published one um, uh, paper uh, indicating that when the resting gap is less than seven millimeters, the chance of closure are higher. That's based on our video fluoroscopic studies in about 100. Right. This is an example of a normal video fluoroscopy. And we have measured and found that the normal length of the palate is about an inch or 2.5 centimeters. And this always knuckles at the same uh, point of contact where the roof becomes the posterior wall, it is at this angle. If you play this, you will notice that it actually touches there. It doesn't touch anywhere here. So what we have been doing with the pharyngeal flap is give, doing it lower down so it doesn't work. So if you are doing a flap, it has to be here. That's point one. Point two is if the resting gap is maintained at seven millimeters or less, it is likely to work much better. If you see a patient with uh, abnormal palate like this one and a palate, and you can notice that the distance between the upper surface of the palate and the roof is huge. So even if you do a furlough or uh, sometimes like Robert Mann has demonstrated, if you do a double flap, it does lengthen, it does tighten the levator, but what actually hangs is the palate hangs down into the mouth. So it doesn't really go and touch the roof. And, and uh, when you look at the video, you can see that the, the movement, there is a good movement, but then that movement is only about 
seven millimeters or less. So therefore, it doesn't touch. If you are able to get it here, the, it is likely to touch. With that premise, we have started, I have devised a different procedure. Actually, correcting the VPI involves two uh, basic uh, principles. One is to do a Z-plasty so that you are pushing back the palate or lengthening the palate and reorienting the levator where it uh, uh, likely to touch the posteropharyngeal pharynx and then get the parent to suspend less than seven millimeters from the roof so that it, it, uh, it is likely to touch. This is one patient with uh, BPI. See, we do a Z-plasty first like this. Then when we actually take a small flap from the palate, about a centimeter wide and about two centimeters long. It is based on the adenoids. So in this case, I'm lifting the flap before I do the Z-plasty. You could actually do following the half of the Z-plasty procedure, then elevate it and do it. It is all right. The principle is to take the flap here and then attach it in the middle of the Z-plasty. So that is the flap which is taken right up to the it is actually a posterior superiorly based pharyngeal flap a tiny one about a centimeter wide based on the lower one third of the adenoids and the donor area is primarily closed Then we continue with the Z-plasty once it is done. I'm sorry, it's gone back. This is the Z-plasty being done. This is a nasal mucosal flap, which is sutured across. And the flap is anchored to the, the nasal mucosal flap that is in the middle of the Z-plasty on the nasal side. That is the flap being anchored there. Plus, the Z-plasty is also sutured to the base of the flap there, that is taking it as close to the roof as possible. You are practically suspending it, suspending it, suspending it to the roof. <clears throat> People have asked me whether it doesn't produce uh, nasal obstruction. It doesn't because all the antagonists to the palate are intact. They pull it open, so it opens up. So it is never a problem of uh, nasal obstruction because flap is so small. On this, again, the muscle is sutured and anchored to the flap. So that is the muscle being sutured. Then we complete the Z-plasty. That's the end of the procedure. It looks like this, and you can't see the, where the flap is because flap is anchored to the, the Z-plasty somewhere here. And the base is above this. Now, there are some results. These were two... Uh, twins, girls. This is a preoperative with nasal speech. What I wanted to show was this, that when you do a flap, 
the gap is less than five millimeters. And that is where the flap has been attached. You can see it here. And the point of contact again is exactly at the same point. In another example, you can lis listen to the speech also, of course, nasality. Again, this, the, this is a twin, other sister, exactly same. The length is almost norm normal and it touches there. At the, you can see the bulge of the adenoids and you can see that the flap is based somewhere here. Normally, we have difficulty in getting the patients for follow-up, so we did the follow-up recording on the phone. That's an example of... Uh, uh, we, now I have done more than 600 uh, cases by the same technique in past, averaging about 100 cases per year. And when the gap is little bigger, then we need to uh, use a little bigger flap and it's modified and it's like a pharyngoplasty because you cannot do a Z-plasty because there is not enough tissue. In that case, you are actually augmenting the nasal side and on the oral side, sometimes it is necessary to use a buckle flap so that it lengthens the oral side as well. Okay, I'll, uh, that's the end of the- sir. Okay. Yes, sir, thank you, sir. So, so this has now opened up a prospect for a lot of discussion here. Uh, Robert Mann showed, uh, though he could not show it in detail, uh, showed his approach, his philosophy for doing primary palate, where he uses buckle flap uh, primarily and then has a very low uh, velopharyngeal dysfunction. But when they happen, he uses the same buckle flaps to, to do his BPD surgery as well. And if he has done a, 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 a Z-plasty in the past, then he would uh, uh, cut the soft palate away from the hard palate and interpose the buckle flaps, thereby gaining length. On the, on the other side, we had uh, Dr. Reddy, who does palato, uh, furlose palatoplasty secondarily, along with the suspension, so that the, the soft palate can go and uh, uh, occlude at the right place. Uh, I must say, before I take questions uh, uh, from anybody else, that uh, uh, we have a quite a significant series of furlose palatoplasties now. We have looked at the result. I recently presented it at the Indian meeting. We are writing it up. We found out that there is an increase in the closure ratio of about 0.3%. And therefore, if your closure ratio to start off with is 0.5 or 6, uh, furlough palatoplasty alone uh, gives us reasonably good results. However, in those cases where you are not going to get complete closure from your preoperative determination, we have started doing this suspension uh, palatoplasty as, as Dr. Reddy has mentioned. I, I, I learned from his videos. I saw him operate. Uh, uh, and I, I have just the initial results. I won't comment on that, but I hope it takes care of those of my patients who cannot benefit just by a Z plasty. But going back to uh, uh, Dr. Mann, um, it must be so gratifying, sir, to have just a, a velopharyngeal dysfunction rate of five to six percent. Uh, what are your comments on that, first of all? Well, uh, for, for your when primary I cases. Right. When yeah. I did the uh, traditional repairs, uh, I was having the same results as everybody. I mean, we all get roughly the same results. And when I've done this now in primaries and, and adding the tissue, reconstructing what's missing uh, from the very beginning, it, it reduces your uh, VPI rate dramatically. And uh, so I strongly recommend that, although it's good to use it secondarily, I really do recommend that uh, consideration for doing it in, a, in the primary reconstruction. I, I want to yeah. echo what Dr. Reddy said. Uh, if you're doing a palatal lengthening, 
It's not a, you're not a, using a, a piece of steel. It's gonna go down the pallet, just like he said. So my functional palatal suspension is very similar to what he's doing. You're pulling the pallet right. up and back and the exact same plane, but you're pulling on the buckle flap tissue. So you're pulling on the reconstructed tensor veli palatini aponeurosis and the vellum is still functioning as the closure engine. And the unlined pharyngeal flap, when we do nasal endoscopy, narrows down to about two to th two and a half millimeters. So it's not going to obstruct. So we don't worry about any kind of uh, obstruction apnea in the future. So that's what I do right. if, the, if the buckle flap lengthening fails after right. uh, I do get VPA in the 6% that are needed to be treated. So you do the suspension. Thank you. Uh, uh, so one of the things... Um, I was. I wanted to ask you. I've asked you this before. This is for the benefit of others as well. When you, when you have a VPD where a buckle flap has not been used primarily, um, do you take into consideration the residual function of the soft palate? Can it be a problem if if the soft palate is very uh, shrunken, scarred, not moving at all when before you do this buckle flap as a secondary what procedure? When I initially published this, I, I thought, uh, and I think I commented in the 2011 uh, article, that I, I like to see movement of the palate. But right. as I got used it more and more, and I had palates that were really locked in scar tissue, I found that once you release the p muscles to their proper position, they will act, reactivate. So I, number one, I don't use it on small gaps anymore. I use it on everybody. Uh, and I have not had to do classic pharyngeal flaps in over 18 years now. And then I also found that when you do the release, the, the levator muscles are really far enough posterior that if you can release them and get them in proper position, a lengthening will still make it and work. Right, so did I answer you. your question? Yes, you did. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, uh, Vasant? Sunil, are there questions for uh, uh, any one of the two speakers on this yeah, the, techniques from the audience? Uh, yeah, Can yeah we there ask are questions. Now? A yeah, question to Dr. Mukund Reddy. Uh, okay. What is the chance of development of obstructive sleep apnea when flap based on the adenoids are used? No, I, I did hundreds of cases. There's not a single case where there is a, a sleep apnea. Uh, we formally didn't do any uh, uh, studies about uh, uh, nasometer also has not been done. But we specifically asked them, do they have any problem with uh, sleeping when they go home? Do they have snoring? There are some patients who complain of snoring. That is a problem in some patients. But usually that also improves with time. The persistent snoring Few patients have reported. I would say less than five percent. Uh, okay. Long term, I, I have no data. It's only six years now since I started doing this. Thank you, yeah. sir. Uh, more questions? Yeah, they, yeah, they have asked. Because, uh, his, uh, about just one his second, uh, Sunil Vaid, uh, Asantya. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they have asked uh, uh, Dr. Mukund Reddy regarding his experience with combined lip and palate surgery. Uh, okay, right, sir. We'll take this one, but uh, we will stick to the topic. Okay, sir, you can answer, sir. Your combined procedures, lip and palate no, together, one in. Combined procedure, lip and palate, for a long time, in the sense, last 20 years. Initially, I started for little older uh, children. Then I started uh, about 15 to 18 years back, uh, children below the age of one, both bilateral and unilateral. I continue to do in unilateral a combined procedure even now, uh, around the age of nine months to 11 months. So I have uh, I have very good results. Uh, I can share a, a two minute video of some results if the moderator permits. Yes, sir, go ahead, sir. So this is not on uh, VPD correction, this is primary repair of lip and yeah, palate maybe we can uh, come back in to one stage, later. yes, sir. Yes, because, sir. please, please, sir. No, sir, we can do it now. Well, let's finish it. No, I'll go, I'll go a little bit on the VPD itself. The total correction, ah, okay. I, 
I'll I'll go when when we talk about growth, etc. All ah, right. So this video is about the VPD correction, sir. Yeah, uh, because ah. this this shows nasendoscopic view of the flap. Ah, okay. So ah, like, right. Okay, sir. Yeah, you can show that, sir. Yes. So yeah. you're going to show a nasoendoscopic view of the of suspension of the perineum flap. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay, sir. There is some problem in. Krishnamurti, sir, can I ask a question in the meantime? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. This is about the primary rhinoplasty. Pramod? No, this is, no, this is about uh, BPD itself. Okay, go on. Go on, Pramod. So the question is, are we. The question is, are yeah. we saying that there is no role for uh, routine uh, uh, superiorly based pharyngeal flaps or the, uh, you know, the uh, orticotia method? Is, is that what we are saying? So, Dr. Reddy, sir, there, is there yeah. no role for pharyngeal flaps, sphincter pharyngoplasty anymore? No, in my, in my library, it is not there because I okay. did do... Uh, uh, one study using pharyngeal flap, it, no, it made no not much of a difference for uh, speed. The conventional right. superior replaced uh, pharyngeal flap, which is attached to the edge of the soft palate, the way it is traditionally thought. Lateral port controls, etc. It doesn't work. And uh, I okay. did try the sphincter pharyngoplasties as well. Again, you have no control, and it has been shown that the 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 palatoglossus, palatopharyngeus muscles actually do not work like a sphincter. So it, it right. only operates and there you have no control on the central uh, opening that you leave. And I found that uh, it has a eddy current principle that they, many people have this uh, problem of uh, breathing properly. So I have discontinued it and I no longer do these two procedures. So, so this is something with your experience you have dropped and you recommend that it, they, they don't have a role right yeah, now. Yeah, I, currently, I, I, don't, I feel that they have no role at all in pilot surgery. I would like the to following... emphasize what Dr. Mann has said, that you do the primary pilot first. He has set the bar very high, that you right. must get less than 10%. Very low. Very low ideally, rate. 5%. With my right. current technique of uh, furlough, uh, I am also getting approximately that, but I don't have accurate data to tell whether it's 5% or 10%, but it's not more than 10%. Sure, sir. So Unfortunately, plan, we are... No, after yes, watching... Yes, sir. Go on, sir. I, I would like to say that my uh, uh, usage of buckle flap, particularly bilaterals, now I routinely use for the oh, primary. oral line, not exactly oh, primary. flaps, single flap. For the primary or... repair, sir, for the primary repair. For the primary repair. Yeah. Yeah. But in uh, unilaterals, I use it occasionally. My, okay. <laughs> Bob, I have my, my resistance to using buckle flap has come down in children after watching you operate. But yeah, uh, so we, I, we, we had that wonderful, we had that yeah. wonderful session at Trishur, sir, when Bob Mann operated for three days. Yeah. I don't think there's any place for a pharyngeal flap or sphincteroplasty. Uh, right, right. At, at this point, that's only if yeah. you have a cancer patient, you've got some paralyzed palate, then right. you're going to have to use it. But otherwise, these other alternatives, I, I think, are going to give you lifetime. I want to have my kids when they're 18 and 19, 20, they are not a, a child with a cleft anymore. They're like everybody else. But the people that have a pharyngeal flap for the rest of their life, they're dealing with that. Bob, one more question from me. Do you do you see any role for any kind of posterior pharyngeal wall augmentation ever in the form of alloplastic material, fat, whatever, to, to, to additionally reinforce what you're doing or that's never required? The posterior pharyngeal wall is too dynamic. There has been okay. a lot of work in that area and everyone either extrudes or it, it misplaces and it's not hitting the, the point of contact properly. Right. Right. So they're really mm -hmm. not effective to, to date. So I, I think okay. we have some, some good alternatives now. And I, I really want to emphasize that we need to reconstruct anatomically 
I think if, I, right. if we're going to have secondary surgery, it needs to be anatomic. And I think if you use right. a Z-plasty, you can do that. I think a Z-plasty plus buckle flaps works. I think a buckle flap plus a palatal suspension works. That maintains a normal speech engine. That's got to be the, the bar at yeah. this point. Yes. So, so that's something that we'll emphasize before we go on to the next question. Dr. If you have to do secondary thing. surgery, if you have to do uh, one second, sir. If you have to do secondary surgery, do an anatomic surgery on the palate, right? Uh, Savita, sorry. I... Yeah. A uh, uh, couple of questions regarding uh, yeah. furloughs. Uh, okay. I do you recommend using furloughs for primary repair? That's one question. This is and to Dr. Reddy or to Dr. This Ma is Dr. addressed Ma to you. This is specifically to addressed to you. To me, yes. okay. Yes. Yeah, I don't do primary furloughs, but Dr. Reddy does it. Uh, and uh, yeah. the other question in the similar line is, uh, can we still use furlough double opposing z plasty as a procedure when intra can z plasty can uh. z plasty be used as a secondary procedure when yeah. IVVP has been used as a primary procedure? Uh, yes, we can do that because uh, in our own cases that we have done that where we have done muscle dissection. I think this is coming from Parit Ladani. Yes, Parit, we can do it. Uh, we have done it. Uh, oftentimes, the muscle uh, is not where you thought you had put it in the first place. So when you do your uh, furlough palatoplasty, you, you get a second chance at rearranging that. Yes. Yes. So we will now move on uh, since we are, uh, so, we are running a little bit. Yeah. So I think Sunil had a question. Which, yeah, Sunil, uh, Sunil, come on. With, yes. Sunil, come on while I'm changing the... Yeah, Sunil, come on. Sunil. Sunil, can you hear me? I'm not. I'm audible now. Yeah, you you speak. Yeah, you are audible. Please go ahead. So the question is mainly to I mean uh, to you and for Dr. Bob. So yeah. buckle flap as a primary palate. Do is that something we are arriving at as a consensus, or we want to reserve it for a secondary? Because a lot of us, including me, we've all been doing primary palates without buckle flaps. And we've been getting excellent results. So should there be a shift towards, so, this is for trainees so, and for young surgeons, what is your consensus yeah. on that, sir? Yeah, so I don't think there's a consensus, but you look at the results. I, I'll speak for Bob Mann for the time being. Uh, if you look at the kind of results he has produced over a long term, I think uh, uh, it is a very, very nice way of going about uh, your repair. What we haven't talked, and I, I'm sure we will come to that, is his, uh, his maxillary growth results. He has shown that the incidence of maxillary hypoplasia, where I'm moving now, he has shown that the incidence of maxillary hypoplasia is significantly lower in his case compared to yours or mine. And he believes it is because he has provided that lining with the buccal tissues. I will let him answer that when we go on this case, Tunil, because that is the second aspect. I don't think we can have consensus, but if, if people get interested in learning that philosophy, particularly you're in, a, in, a, in a early stages, that will be a good idea. So thanks, Sunil. We'll move on to the next case. Now, I will club two cases here. So these are uh, two cases of, of uh, early maxillary hypoplasia that I want to show you so as to put the uh, things in a setting. And we will discuss both of these together. I think uh, uh, Maria will uh, come back as well as Dr. Mustafa here in a big way. So he's, uh, this is a seven-year-old kid that uh, uh, we have operated earlier on for cleft lip and palate. And today, that is the kind of uh, uh, cross bite he has got, okay? And that, those are his, uh, he's in the mixed dentition. He's just uh, getting his central incisors, lateral incisors, just grafting. And uh, th that is the kind of profile he has on the uh, lateral cephalogram. Here is another, oh, that's him. Sorry, this is what, after we have treated him, I will skip those slides. Now there is another patient here. I'm sorry for, uh, the, the, uh, for the rotation of that uh, particular picture. Another one at uh, uh, 12 years of old, post, uh, post alveolar bone grafting, and uh, also has a significant amount of uh, uh, collapse of the maxilla. And those are his uh, uh, cephalometric pictures. So, there are two important issues I want to address with these two cases. Number one is when you see a child in a mixed dentition period at pre-ABG or post-ABG, and you find that there is a significant maxillary hypoplasia developing, 
we all know that growth intervention is the option. So I want Maria to first talk to us about the growth interventional aspects, her philosophy. She has done a lot of work on that. And then I will go to the surgeons as well, whether there is any surgical procedures that may be required as a staging procedure before we do definitive surgeries when the growth is complete. So uh, Maria, you have the screen now. Okay, I'll share mine. Is that okay? Right. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Okay, so um, it is structured exactly as you have. So first, very young children, what to do and what not to do, and then what to do in, in permanent dentition. So children that are much closer to the completion of their growth. Um, this is a typical question that we get from our surgeons and from the patients. And um, what we should know, all of us orthodontists, but all of us surgeons as well, is that when you have a child who's sort of class three-ish, when he's five and he doesn't look that, that bad, um, he's going to look much worse when he's 10. And after 11, 13 years of age, he's going to be um, a decisive um, um, growth towards class three and generally towards uh, surgery. Um, this evolution is a lot more evident in bilaterals, a lot faster. And the when I was a resident, so I'm, I'm talking 1991, um, my teachers, who were great teachers, were still um, brought up with the concept that if you um, treated these children really early, uh, you would make them breathe better and you would make them... Um, put their tongue in the proper position so you would improve their prognosis in the long term. And the question, is that true and how are we going to do that? And the instrument, so I would go sort of backwards, I would talk about the instrument that we're using so we're aware of, of limits and advantages because in most countries all over the world, the instrument that is considered now universally the most efficient is a face mask which is actually a very old instrument. Um, they started using it at the end of the 18th, 19th century. But we have to know at, at least three things, and I think the surgeon needs to know that as well. Uh, number one, it works fine early on. So you can use it at six, seven, eight, but then if you use it at 10, 11, it's not as efficient. Uh, second point is how much it gives you. It really gives you very little. So if you think in terms of millimeters of advancement and you tell your surgeon, so I tell Luca Utelitano, who's a surgeon that I work with, that I get, give him two millimeters, he's not going to be particularly excited about it. So you have to keep into account this, this aspect. And the third aspect, which is the most important of all, is what Tin Lund has told us. Tin Lund, um, he was actually also in Chennai, has um, shown one of the best papers. He still thinks that it's a good thing to do early protraction of the maxilla, but he very, very honestly shows you this graph so that whatever you get in terms of correction, of A and B correction, is going to be lost within two years, more or less, two, two and a half years. And you're going to see it in this patient who was treated at the Smile House many years ago. She did look much prettier, of course, at seven, but then at 11, she was class three-ish, and at 16, she was ready for the Fort one osteotomy. So this is an old case. Um, so if we want to answer the question, does early treatment in class three patients really change cleft lip and palate prognosis? At this point in time, I think the it is universally accepted that the reply is no. It's been shown by Ross, by the Euroclef studies. We've done a study on our own patients treated by different orthodontists around the country. And it's said by the American Cleft Lip and Palate Association. So treating early really doesn't improve prognosis in terms of future growth. What it does though, it it helps a child in certain instances. So there are exceptions. For example, if a child has a strong trauma, we know that trauma causes, like in this case, resorption of the root. So you have to do something. You either give her a plate, or if she has some aesthetic requirement, you can advance the maxilla. You advance it, you get a nice result, but you have to tell the parents ahead 
that in a matter of three years, she's going to look exactly the same. And that's when we're going to start the second phase of treatment that I'll tell you about. Um, there's another exception that I like very much, and we're, we're actually um, 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 writing, we've written that up and it's um, going to come up on the laryngoscope for the time being. When you do expansion and advancement of the maxilla, what you do is you stretch the tubal dilator muscles. So a child who usually has recurrent otitis and oftentimes goes into the NT department to get tubes, doesn't need them any longer. And we've had really beautiful results in that that um, have been studied by Professor Felizati, who's our ENT surgeons. You get improvement in terms of hearing, improvement in terms of elasticity of, of your eardrum. So that's particularly important to me. Um, I've had the honor of writing a state of the art in the Indian Journal, and I reported the fact that in about uh, a little more than 65% of the children who have loss of hearing can gain it thanks to orthodontics. So that's a good exception to the rule that I've given you. Another exception could be osis patients. In all of the osis patients, when we expand and advance, if the reason is the narrowness of the maxilla, then you can reduce obstructive sleep apnea, especially children who've had a flap or children who have a peculiar um, narrowness of the um, upper jaw. Um, of course, the diagnosis is first of all made by the uh, sleep doctor. Then it goes to the ENT surgeon who says, okay, this is where the air doesn't come through. And then I get in and do the orthodontics. Another exception can be given by um, the uh, speech pathologist, Dr. Rizzonico is our wonderful speech therapist. And uh, if she tells me she wants me to advance the maxilla because she needs it for better articulation, I do it. But this is really a brainless procedure. She's a brain, I'm just a hand, and I do it when she tells me to do it. So, and we don't have the data yet about that. So just to sum up for the little kids, I would say, Early treatment, no, in general, aside when you have trauma, ENT problems, obstructive sleep apnea, sometimes articulation problems. Very seldom, to be honest with you, in a child of five or six, I've had the child asking me, but I have. And in these cases, I think you can do early. Otherwise, I would rather go for a later correction. I don't know if you want me to go, keep on going now, or do you yeah. want to stop? Yeah? No, yeah. Just, just finish the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. So then your next question was what to do later on then. And I just postponed the numbers a little bit because it's more between 10 and 15 years of age. So closer to permanent dentition that I like doing things. At that stage, our question of course is if you want to do something, it has to be stable. It has to be really worth it. And so what you need is something that gives you more protraction in terms of millimeters something that is more efficient so it works all the time and something that you can start as late as possible but with the sutures still open so um, many many years ago um, eric Leo was uh, together with me when i was in chicago and um, then he came actually in 2001 to milano for a cleft lip and palate meeting and uh, he was already doing a pr this procedure uh, using this special uh, expander that you see here, um, which allows all the sutures to open up completely. So not only the mid path suture, but you open completely the zygomatical maxillary sutures, the pterygo maxillary sutures, all these sutures inside the orbits. When, once all these are nicely activated, then you can start at the right time, which has to be um, usually at puberty, uh, we as orthodontists use very much the uh, vertebral stage of maturation. So what you do is you put your expander, you open and close, open and close, open and close seven times or nine times. When you feel that the maxilla is mobile, almost as if you had a non-union after Lefort one osteotomy, then you start with your springs, springs or sometimes elastics. Um, and we, we publish the long-term data, so I mean on children that are almost 19 years of age with um, an average advancement of 5.7, so almost 
six millimeters. And that's a number that when you talk to a surgeon is really respectful. Uh, we've done it also on class three patients who don't have a cleft. And of course it works very well as in those patients as well. Uh, and just rapidly to show you how it works, you have a child like this. At the time, this was 2004, I didn't use TADS. So what I did was uh, decompensating teeth as if we were going to do a Lafort one osteotomy. And then we did open, close, and open, close, open, close seven times. Then the maxilla was mobile. We would start the retraction and the maxilla would come forward all the way. So almost like a Lafort one osteotomy. So this was the result after seven millimeters of advancement. And this is very nice and interesting, but what's more important to me is not this. This is more important that at 24 years of age, she's still perfectly stable. She doesn't brush her teeth, but she has a perfectly stable uh, skeletal pattern. So what we've done was actually done late enough to be stable in the long term. I'll just show you a couple of examples very rapidly. Um, another child, one of those beautiful Bruzati's children, and then you see them at 10 and they start being class three-ish. You see them at 13 and they're definitely growing into a class three. So that's when we come in as orthodontists. Uh, we um, pull completely forward the maxilla, the bony part of the maxilla. In the meantime, we work on the teeth in order to uh, match the midlines. And then once we're done, this is the result in terms of stability also at 20 years of age after the um, rhinoplasty uh, that you can see up there uh, done by Dr. Oteritano. Uh, very rapidly, another couple of examples. This is how I approach girls now. I tend to really overcorrect because I think a cleft child needs a lot more support, both skeletal and dental, than an uncleft child. So this is a child that in her whole life has only done one expansion and the two surgical steps that Professor Bruzzati used to do. Then we did our open, close, open, close and advancement. And this is what she looks like at 18. And if you notice occlusally, I really don't care if I have a, a class two. I really want her to be pretty. I don't want her to have a class one occlusion. So the objective is really not teeth, it's her face. Um, I'll just show you one, I think one other example. This is a, a case that we discussed with together with Dr. Rizzonico. She had a um, borderline speech. If we had done, even if in a severe case like this, a Lafort one osteotomy, it would have definitely been a problem for his speech. So what we did was our open close. You see the scarring of the palate. He's an adopted child. Um, we did our open close, open close, and I'll show you the results at 20 years of age. This is his occlusion, and this is his smile at 20 years of age. So extremely stable no relapse. We do have some relapse in males. I wouldn't call it relapse. The mandible growth grows later in males, so you're not as sure in males than you are in females. But the success, if it's done properly, is extremely high. And it helps very, very much keeping treatment time for these children as low as possible. And this is just to remind you that I've had the bad luck of becoming president of the European Society <laughs> So I'm inviting you all in 2023. So that's it. I'll, I'll unshare. Yeah. Sure. Uh, hopefully, sans COVID, Maria, we'll all be there. <laughs> so, well, let's hope no COVID any longer. You'll all wish to travel a lot. Right. So coming back, I think this is a very important presentation. So I'm, I'm slightly changing my rules. I'm going to take a lot of questions now. I know there are quite a few orthodontists here. But before I, uh, I uh, allow the floor to ask questions to you, and then I'll go to the surgeons for their opinions, I have a couple of questions to you. Number one uh, is, with, as you look at these long-term results, do you think this is going to reduce the need for a maxillary advancement in your, see, in your uh, patients? And if so, what percentage of them may not need a maxillary advancement or any orthognatic surgery at all? So uh, yes, the, to the first question, that is a reason why Professor Bruzzati liked it so much because in our publication comparing Milano to Oslo, we had about 25% need for osteotomy compared to Oslo who had about 13% need for osteotomy. Now, whether you consider the differences in ethnicity or, or mandible 
between people from Milano or people from Oslo, um, not thinking about that, but just think of, um, about our own center. We definitely have reduced substantially the need. I would say in clefts, cleft girls, we, of course, I, it won't reduce in the whole because I'm not treating every single one of these children, but let's say the ones that I can get my hands on, yeah. I, I would say that we, of the um, 30 children that I've published in terms of females, we only have about 6%. So there's one girl that has needed osteotomy afterwards. Boys, we're not sure yet because the long term is 18 and a half. And sometimes you have a beautiful 18 year old who has a very good occlusion. And then at 20, he's like an edge to edge. And I don't think an edge to edge is a good position for a child. So for, for anybody, because that's a very traumatic position. So in males, I would think that you could reduce it substantially, but you would still have a 10% need for osteotomy. I'll, I'll ask you a very serious question now. You don't have to answer this. Have you ever been threatened by surgeons that you're taking away their work from them? No, because especially in clefts, there's no money involved. Oh, so okay. because there's no money involved, they're all happy. So they're all happy. Well, if I do that, that means they're better surgeons because they need less spinal surgery. All so, right. They, they, they're, they're happy to have your results this way. Absolutely. So one more last question before I uh, let the floor ask you. When you start the, when do you normally, at what age is it finishing? Uh, so in girls, probably the growth is complete and boys it's not. Is that why the difference between boys and girls? Very much, yes. Um, I would say in girls, the average, although age is not what I use a, a, as a, a measure, right. but <laughs> let's say we used age, I think girls in general, I start towards 12-ish, 12 ish 12 okay. Boys at about 14, okay. which right. is usually, it corresponds also girls at 12, 13 starts really wanting to become pretty. So they help a lot. Boys at 12 don't care as much, but when they start being going towards their 14-ish, they really okay. want to be hunks, look better. So they help you a lot more, yeah. Okay, so there is also a question for you from the YouTube group. I will start with what I have. Uh, so someone has asked, what is the rationale behind seven times opening and closing? So why seven times? Okay, well, seven is actually the original protocol from, um, from Eric. And Professor Bruzzati said it was some kind of uh, Chinese Kabbalah or something. Right. <laughs> in, in reality, I um, started trying with, it has to be uneven. So an odd number, why? because you open once, twice, three times, it has to be completely open because you want the sutures to be separated so that then the maxilla comes forward more easily. Right. Um, I've tried with five and I felt the maxilla and it just wasn't mobile. To be honest with you, in about half of my patients, seven is not enough. So okay. I go for nine. So okay. it has always to be an odd number. But when I see the patient at seven, I feel it's not mobile enough. I go another two weeks and I have in the big presentation, a few cases where I went up to 11. The good okay. thing of this thing of, of this method is that you overexpand, but then while you come forward, you let the maxilla close down again. So you don't have any periodontal problems to the teeth that you're attached to. So there's one more question here. Is it done in one go? consecutively or at various time points this uh, it, seven pounds is it consecutive one go one go and, and the problem is that the, if if the parents are not particularly smart and they make a mistake and they come and instead of being completely open it's completely closed because they've done something wrong you have to start all over again over again so the compliance is important that they come uh, absolutely uh, uh, so there's there's another question which i think you've already answered but i'll just go through it does the Ultramec reduce the need for PSSO and before that might be needed later on in terms of age? I think you've answered that. So these are the questions I have. Uh, do the moderators have any other questions or I, can I go to the surgeons for their viewpoint in the panel? Vasant, Sunil, do you have questions for Maria, particularly from uh, orthodontist? They, yeah, they, they have asked, how do you make this appliance? Uh, that is one oh. question. 
Excuse how me. Do make, how do you make these appliances? Make you, it. Yeah. How do you pre prepare it, the 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 springs? You have to just bend them yourself. That's for an orthodontist is not a big deal. Um, for the um, expander, which is probably the question, you there's none pre-produced. So what you have to do is you have your technician solder two fan expanders. So is they're just two regular fan expanders from Dentorum and they're soldered together and then soldered to the bands. Maria, I asked you this question at the Utrecht. Uh, would you be happy now with all the COVID and all that if we have continue and have a cleft meeting in India in February, March next year to come and do a course for our orthodontists, a hands-on course on fabrication and use? I, you know, I adore Indians. As long as you make me dance, I am happy. Yes, I will do. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm ready. <laughs> what I've already proposed promote that when we meet in Kochi next year, Maria will do a hands-on course for orthodontists, so they can That's learn great. how to. I'd love to. Yeah. Hopefully, COVID will not prevent us from doing it. So, any more questions, Sunil Vasant? So, can okay, I can sir. I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Go on, promote. This question, uh, this this question is to uh, Dr. Maria. Uh, do you mean that you don't do any more of the face mask at all now? In that mixed presentation, is true. Is that you gave some questions, Pramod. Um, take that. Yeah. The, the The question was, I if I use in in little children the face mask. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You, does you does it mean you will never do it? That was the question. No, what I yes, said is I do that. still do it. it. If the child doesn't hear well, I always use it. If the child doesn't breathe well, I always use it. If there's strong trauma, I always use it. If my speech pathologist orders me to do it, uh, and she's pretty strong in terms of character. Um, <laughs> and sometimes uh, if the child asks me, but it's not that common in children that are five or six. Um, Sometimes I let family and children convince me to do it. But otherwise, if I can allow the child to grow, if he breathes well, hears well, has a normal social life, I would rather do it in one step. So that orthodontic treatment is not a nightmare. Because w the study that we published in 2013, um, in, in, in Sao Paulo, we couldn't treat many of the patients that Professor Bruzzati operated on. So they were operated in Italy in many, many um, centers. And most centers tried, started with uh, face masks at three years of age, even if the child wasn't really a class th three, just because they said, if I bring it forward, he's going, he's a cleft, so he needs it. And um, all this early orthodontics is very heavy on the child and on the family. So you want to really keep it uh, as, as short as possible. Thank you. There are no exceptions. So to continue, yeah. it nothing. Thank you. Any so, other questions? So can I can I uh, yeah. to continue with that? Uh, oh, sure. I I saw I saw from your uh, pictures in the uh, mixed presentation with the young children and uh, with our club center experience with uh, Dr. Maria Kuriakos that there is a significant improvement in the Mala region, the zygomatic region after you do the reversible headgear, which actually retains. Uh, even throughout the growth. And uh, it is not something that which we commonly address with the report on osteotomy, the malar hypoplasia, not the maxilla per se. So, uh, and in addition to that, it definitely improves the appearance of the child in that particular age. So there, sh there could be a psychosocial, uh, you know, uh, uh, influence as well on the child and the parents. Do you think that, uh, what do you think about that? Um, well, the mailer enhancement, you get it also in the later, actually you get more because instead of advancing only two millimeters, you advance five. So you get a lot more with the other technique. Um, in terms of psychosocial, um, at, at least in our patients, the severity is not such that I would see uh, children that are desperate, but I do do it in some of the adopted children that come and the families really ask for something. But, but the thing is that you have to be completely honest with the families, that it's something that doesn't stay. So you're not, 
well, the thing is, I was taught that what you do at five or six is going to improve prognosis. It's not. So what I'm doing is not improving prognosis. It's maybe helping temporarily the child if needed. But if the child doesn't want it, I, I am definitely not going to be the one imposing it. That, that's what I meant and the message that I wanted you to, to get. Thank you. So I, I will now take uh, quick comments from all the other surgical panelists of mine and then we'll go on to the next case. Dr. Mustafa? Yeah. Uh, will you give me two minutes uninterrupted screen space? Just two minutes. I'll give you two minutes, 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah, thank so your you. time starts now. Okay. Uh, the first thing that I want to say is, you can hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The first thing that uh, I want to say is, I agree with uh, what Maria has said uh, about uh, using the yes, face we can. mask. Yeah, about using the face mask. Of lately, we have stopped using them uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, it is purely a, a dental phenomenon, and whatever force that you apply doesn't actually get transmitted to the uh, circummaxillary suture. It indirectly gets transmitted. And uh, another issue with that is because they have to wear it continuously for a long period of time. And uh, uh, for the kind of effort, uh, the, what you get in terms of outcome is, is very marginal. So considering these aspects, off lately what we are doing is we do what is called as a, because uh, basically, uh, face mask is a tooth bone appliance. What we are doing is a bone bone protraction. So we place uh, one <clears throat> on each side at the one plate on the uh, zygomatic buttress and one at the uh, lat uh, lateral incisor canine region of the mandible. And then we do a continuous protraction with the help of elastics. Initially, for first one month, we give uh, around uh, 75 pounds, grams, sorry, 75 grams. Followed uh, the next month, we give uh, the elastic for around 150, then continuously for around uh, 250 for a prolonged period of time. So we have started doing that. So one of the examples that uh, we have done, I will uh, try to show it to you. So this is the preoperative uh, uh, details of the patient. And after minimum one month, we start the elastic therapy and uh, this is how uh, uh, the movement has occurred. This is too early now. Uh, it is only just three months. And uh, that is the changes that we could see after two months and after five months. We are too early with our results. But the premise is that uh, the force that you apply will directly uh, get uh, 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 into the circum uh, maxillary suture and the movement will be better. So that is, that is the result we have been, achieve, be, been able to achieve at five months. Okay. Uh, this is what we intend to do. In case if the, uh, uh, for the second case, what you said at 12 years, if there is severe uh, maxillary hypoplasia, uh, and this is uh, what we did in one of these patients. <coughs> uh, this is the case. With a severe maxillary hypoplasia, they were very particular that something needs to be done for this child. So she had some issues with the school in the school. So what we did is we did an anterior maxillary distraction. That is the preoperative results. So this is uh, after anterior maxillary distraction, it resulted in some amount of open bite. And this I did it recently. I finished the distraction when the lockdown has taken place. I had great deal of trouble sending her back. I had to go all uh, by myself to leave her at the border and transport her across the border. So I'm sorry about the uh, uh, post-operative pictures. Yeah, three minutes are up, Mustafa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, is, uh, what, yeah. this is what uh, the changes that we have been able to achieve. And in this case, we did an anterior maxillary distraction along with the bone-to-bone uh, -bone anchorage plates we have placed. So that way, we'll be able to contain further growth of the mandible. So these, this is uh, what I just wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Mustafa, so, I have one question. What, what age are these patients that you are, uh, are the, you considering the, the, the age or? Yeah, the bone-to-bone -bone protraction now we have decided to do for females, for female patients about nine years of age. And okay. for male patients, about 11. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Miazini, I'm sorry, you have some more very important questions here. Can you come back? I will just ask you these questions. They have come from the group. 
I I want to take them because they're very interesting. Are you with us? I'm right there. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is, uh, what is the extent of results that we can anticipate if we are using a regular high racks as opposed to the screw use your Ultramec protocol? Um, if you look at the literature, it's usually um, in terms of millimeters of advancement of the of the maxilla, you get. Uh, quite a bit less. So we're talking close to six millimeters. Most studies talk about three millimeters. And the reason is there's a good study in the histology of the sutures after the open and close with the, um, uh, with the double hinge compared to a regular hyrax. If you look at the sutures after um, the, the group of Taiwan has done it on um, on cats. Uh, in Italy, we could never do it on cats. I think my kids would kill me. But uh, basically, what you see is uh, that the sutures after that open and close with the two hinges um, shows really nicely relaxed and extended fibers and a lot of osteoblasts. Whereas if you look at, at what happens to the, especially the lateral sutures, so what you need for, to advance is you don't care about what happens in the, in the middle. You, need, you want something in this area and you want something happening at the back. And that ha doesn't happen when you use a regular hyrax. So right. I would suggest, because it doesn't make any difference in terms of cost and, right. and you don't need a genius as a technician, you might as well use a right, the correct expander. Sure. So the next question is, how long is the Ultramec appliance left behind after the expansion is achieved? Well, the, the expansion device is used as anchorage together with little mini screws for the whole advancement period. So usually you need six to eight months to advance the maxilla. And then once you've obtained the overcorrection, you take everything out and you let the child alone for three, four months and see how it settles in. And then you do either regular orthodontics or nothing or depending on what, what the family wants. So that but, leads us to the next question. Yeah. If you do maxillary protraction at 12 years, even girls continue to grow till 15. So how long will ortho continue? This is uh, in response to your burden of care uh, uh, point, I think. That's the reason why I don't use an age. I use vertebral stage of maturation and menarche. So right. if the girl has just reached puberty, and is starting her third uh, vertebral stage of maturation. That means that within a year and a half, she's done growing. So between the ultramic and the orth finishing orthodontics in two years, she stopped growing. That right. is why I usually don't look at age. I okay. have growth where I've started at right. right, so that this question becomes infructuous then. Thank you, uh, Dr. Miazini. I to uh, Dr. Mon. Uh, sorry, sir, uh, this discussion took a long time. Uh, so I have one more case discussion pending. So I want you to uh, make quick comments, sir, on, on your philosophy and how it affects maxillary hypoplasia. Bob? Uh, can I screen share for just like six slides or so? Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Thank you very much for coming in here such an early morning time and sparing this time. People are enthusiastic. We are, we are, we are already delayed. That's the only, I, I wish we had more time. But yes, sir, you can because the principle of your your methodology of your treatment has led to a great advantage, as I know, in maxillary growth. And I want you to share that. So what I'm showing here is looking at uh, the the first uh, 238 children that uh, reached age 16 and looking at uh, the kids that once again had just these smaller clefts that had the Z-plasties. And you can see essentially none of them really 1% needed, 1.6% were recommended for jaw surgery. Whereas in the uh, Z-plasty buckle flap group, which is the larger, it's 4.5% needing. But in, remember that includes some of the large uh, uh, these are the vote threes and fours, all non-syndromic. So let's go back and look at 
comparing the traditional approach, once again, in that 177 patients of mine that I was involved with, but we're also now gonna include the, the need for jaw surgery. So overall, our jaw surgery requirement was 17%. So our success rate is the measurement of how well our early surgeries do to achieve normal dental facial balance and normal speech. And our success rate was 67%. But now let's look again at the VO three and fours. How many of those children reach our success rate of achieving normal speech, normal face? Well, in these speech, these children, we, we see that the non-syndromic threes and fours, once again, 53% needed speech surgery. And interestingly enough, 53% also needed jaw surgery. So when you bring those two together, how many of those children did not need either face surgery or jaw surgery, and the answer was 9%. So we're succeeding in our threes and fours by the measure that we like to use of a normal face, normal speech, 9% of the time, we're failing 91% of the time in that patient population. So how did the anatomic palate restoration group go? How, those children that had buckle flaps right away. So yes, use your buckle flaps right away because in my first 116 patients greater than 16 years of age, non-syndromic, only 4.5% needed jaw surgery. So if we put that together, like we see that we have a normal face and a normal speech not requiring either of those events 89.6% of the time. That means that compared to traditional surgery, the anatomic palate restoration is a successful 80% more. So I think the amazing things we've just seen orthodontically are incredible. But I, I think that uh, uh, my colleagues in orthodontics will be super happy if they only have to do that 80% less because it's, a, it's an incredible work that they're doing. But I think this is a, a, a nice way to, uh, um, to do that. And, and all of the things in the anatomic palate restoration uh, is, is about reducing the things that impact on facial growth. And we don't have time to go into that right now, but I think this shows that if you do, once again, start the path correct for the child when they're born with a lip that is not too tight, that impacts it, without having early bone graft and periosteoplasty, without doing all these uh, things that we know impact facial growth and replace the tissue that's missing you're going to get a circumstance where you're gonna have a much better result and you're gonna have a lot less problems to deal with when you're dealing with the teenagers. And quite frankly, in my practice, I wanna take care of the family and the children. So when the children are young adults, they're having fun with sports, with music, with all the activities of life and education and they don't have to be involved with jaw cases complex orthodontia because we fixed it by getting them on the right path. So that's all I'm going to add because um, I think that's, Bob, thank that's you. what I'm trying to have as my message today. Bob, thank you very much. And uh, I can summarize this, that uh, all surgeons who do primary clefts will have to look at this carefully and uh, mull whether they're not doing the wrong thing by not, uh, not taking to your approach. So. Uh, so it's a very, very important point here, not only from the point of view of getting normal speech, but also normal growths. And I'm sure you have made quite a few people think about it. And we have a group of orthodontists as well here. So I'm sure uh, we will uh, discuss more about this uh, on a later date. Uh, before I now go on to, uh, thank you, Bob. Go on to, uh, before I go on to Nasser, I want some quick comments from Dr. Reddy, because he also wants to emphasize the same point as to how to prevent secondary surgeries. Dr. Reddy, sir? Yeah. I echo what uh, Bob has said, but uh, <clears throat> these are uh, people have asked me about uh, results of uh, a total correction. These are a couple of examples to illustrate what I meant. Right. Uh, this is typically what I do now. Do the yes, lip and palate together and do the palate repair by a Z-plasty without lateral incisions. These are right. the average results that we have. 
there is a good arch form without any orthodontic stress good speech another example consistently every patient looks good in the sense basically like bob was saying they were, we want the children to mingle and you must find it difficult to identify if the child had a cleft or not when they walk into your your own consulting room good arch form hardly any scar in the palate good good, good speech I'll stop there. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So your message is that if you do primary surgery without much scarring, um, uh, uh, like yes. Bob, Bob has mentioned, yes, that the so children you, should look absolutely normal, and we should right. not require the help of neither speech therapist nor orthodontist, except right. in rare cases. Sure, sir. So we will now move on to the last two cases. Uh, uh, Nasa, sir, really sorry for making you wait. Uh, for such a long time i hope you enjoyed the rest of those presentations but we will go on i will just introduce you to those two cases these were yes. cases that nasa nasa saw uh, in my clinic operated on them many years ago this guy uh, is the bilateral one he had a lot of other problems he had a big fistula he had speech issues and so on and so forth but we will concentrate on his bilateral nose and then look at him from the lateral view and then uh i won't show you all of these now and then there is uh this patient who who was unilateral so what we will now do is uh, we will go on to nasa's screen and uh, he will talk to us about his philosophy of cleft nose and then we'll discuss these cases and any other questions that you might have nasa please yes um uh, good afternoon yeah. uh, to to all the audience look i've been listening to um some wonderful papers and i hope this will complement what you've been hearing uh, all all this morning uh, my management of cleft lip nasal deformity is based on a global context uh, this is because of most of these facilities of orthodontic health um speech therapy uh, and all other adjuncts are not available to the patients in the third world and underdeveloped and oppressed countries so let me just give you a brief example of uh, of how we proceed um uh, i just thought this super intelligent guy should be at the beginning of our talk there is no such thing as global as you well know in his view um here we are uh this is where i do my work um in in these places the problems that i see when i see nose nasal deformities are these as i explained um and most most of the problems are created by poor patient's compliance and surgery in the wrong chronological sequence um there are some technical pearls i hope this will be used i'll just go through these quickly um uh, now these are the problems this under projection of tip total absence of tip projection sometimes infra tip lobule deformity <coughs> columella deformities and prolabium variety and uh, here's example of some of these under projections look at that wide nasal tip that's the other problem asymmetry in unilateral cases total absence of tip projection where the tip lip complex becomes one um and then infra tip lobule either deficiency or deformity where the infra tip lobule merges into an almost non-existent columella and then short columella 
and varieties of prolegium. Now, the prolegium can be either part of the lip of the, of the nasal tip lobule complex or deficient or totally non-existent. The prolabium again, it can be an island or a flap or a no transition zone. You see, that's an example of, a, of, a, of an island or an insula. Again, an island. Or it may be a flap from columnar base to the vermilion line and sometimes no transition zone, as you see in these two patients. So, what about the lobule, air lobules? Deformed, non-congruent, non-harmonious. Three types. Nostril cell, variations in width. And Codimano, I've said this to you before. Orientation of the nostrils. Pre-maxillary base. Now, this is again a very important issue in a unilateral prep. It's deficient, asymmetric, sometimes non-existent. But look what happens. If you put, if you augment the pre-maxillary base, you then create a secondary deformity of the ala. So you need that corrected by placing an ala rim graft and also by lengthening the columella, but it's the whole tripod mechanism is out of sync here. I can't go into details because of brevity of time, but this is just showing you how I assess my patients. I put a little wad of cotton wool under the premaxilla, under the nasal base, and then see the deformation that occurs in the nostril, and then try and correct that with a cotton wool tip. Uh, there are methods and instrumentations we use um, which help us to achieve our goals. Show you an example of an ailer rim graft to correct this ailer rim deformity. <clears throat> Just show you a video, but I'll show you the actual text in a minute. <clears throat> Now we'll go back, we'll go back and show the lecture. Okay. Um, um, just show you using a sandpaper to, to smoothen your grafts, um, using uh, urethral dilators to make tunnels. Um, just show, ah, one of the things that I still notice, tragedy of the incisions for primary repair go around the ala rim, and that virtually makes it impossible to make a secondary revision or correction. And, and this should be discouraged. I mean, I, I try and get this message across to some surgeons I come across elsewhere, not in India, I hasten to add, uh, but the message falls on deaf ears. Um, here's an example of someone I treated before who's had seven previous operations, but the maxillary base has not been addressed. And she needed a vein. And again, for access on these patients, you can use existing scars where possible. And don't, again, violate the nose where there's been extensive scarring. You can reach a lot of the nose through these scars. Here's a premaxillary graft, a large premaxillary graft, and then a graft for the caudal septum, an extension and then a lateral ala wall. And then this is something I've innovated, a split costal cartilage graft where you intentionally deform the cartilage to, to achieve the shape of the nostril that you wish to make. You see what happens with these grafts when you, when you carve them. And there's the technique using a small incision at the base of the ala rim, making a tunnel using the Watson chain probe and then threading the graft and you create a near normal nostril. You see, uh, that's the video we we're going to show you but it's somehow not working. Um, fixing the graft, you know, the coral septal extension graft to the anterior nasal spine is an essential part of the exercise. And there's some examples of a short columella or lip scar extending into columella base 
Um, here's what I do. You see, these traditional flaps, they don't work. Believe me, they don't work. It's all being tried out. They do sometimes, but I'll show you where they do work. Here's what we do. We reposition a skin flap to lengthen the columella. There we are, there's another example. Release the pronebial skin, extend the incision as if for an open rhinoplasty. Free the cartilages, and then full thickness graft to the lip or later use an abbey flap. And then we do need projection of the nasal tip using either tenth rib or teapot graft from the auricular cartilage. But it changes a, a, a patient from this type of appearance we see to something slightly different. Um, failing that, these people, so there's some who do not listen. They go and have the rhinoplasties done before they have had their alveolar bone grafting and, and maxillary procedures, and this leads to disappointing results. Um, but anyway, um, now we can discuss those cases, uh, Kita. Sure. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> can you tell us, um, shall I put yes. the pictures up or? Uh, if you would, please, if you would put the I pictures will, up. And, and then uh, I'm looking for that presentation. First one's a bilateral cleft. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so I will put the bilateral one up. And I have uh, some of those things that you did uh, um, to him in stages as well in that. So Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we go. Uh, whilst you're doing that, uh, Mustafa, you mentioned uh, about semi-open rhinoplasty. Uh, I've not heard the terminology before. What you're mentioning is full delivery technique or partial delivery technique? Partial oh, delivery. Uh, I mean, I am mean, able to deliver the, the, the lower lateral cartilage in either side completely. Uh, yes. But I don't use a transcolumellar incision. That means I don't... That's called a delivery the technique the without... Yeah. It's yeah, called yeah. a delivery technique without delivery opening technique. the yeah. nose. Yeah. yeah. It's called delivery technique. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Brad, uh, where are we now? Here's a patient... Yeah. Can you can you see the pictures now? I do indeed. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, so can, you can take us through. Yeah, you can take, take us through. through. Yeah. Um, his this is a chap. He's about twenty two, if I remember That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And he had had his successful primary and secondary surgery and maxillary distraction. Uh, what has happened as a direct consequence of the maxilla being brought forward? is that his ala base width has now gone well beyond the norm. The norm being, if you drop perpendicular from the medial canthus down to the upper lip, <coughs> the ala should be just touching or should be just beyond that line. Now, if you look at this guy, he has at least a centimeter excess on both sides, one side more than the other. Uh, in addition, he has got a little bit of lip asymmetry. It's got a very short columella, transversely orientated nostrils, wide cell to his nasal base. And the columella is virtually merging into the uh, little prolabial skin flap. Okay, uh, can we see the profile? It's not a true profile, it's almost three yeah, quarters. Sure. You can see yeah. that he has tip retraction. The normal tip lobule should project beyond the dorsal line, a line, an imaginary line dropped from the nasion, sitting comfortably along the length of the dorsum. The tip should touch that line or should be beyond that line. So this tip is under projected. Furthermore, if you look carefully, the domes, this patient's ailer domes, are virtually where his columella is. The infratip lobule is virtually his columella. 
So we need, in order to make his nose look normal, we need to extend, we need to project his nose forward by at least 1.5 centimeters. And you cannot do that by placing a strut just like that in his nose. It just ain't possible. So here's what we did for him. Have you got the operating? Yeah, sequence? I, I, yeah, I, 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 it's a little bit off sequence, but I'll, yeah, let's okay. go on this one. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the first thing, he was not ready for an AB flap. He had a reasonably, um, um, shall we say, lax upper lip, enough substance in the lip. So what we did was, like I showed you in my lecture, a very thin, superiorly based columnar flap. Uh, if you keep this flap of adequate thickness supplied by the dermal plex, subdermal plexus of vessels, you will not lose this skin, skin flap. I have done these for over 12, 13 years, and I can put my hand on my heart and promise you that I haven't lost a single flap, um, provided you stick to surgical principles. There's the length that you get and in addition, you need to project this nose. So I use a 10th rib cartilage, which is what is in place. It's fixed to the anterior nasal spine and then circumferential sutures um, like a strut to the medial crura and, and lengthening the medial. You may have to do a lateral crural advancement to further project the tip as we have done in this particular patient. And look at the uh, difference now between the pre-op and the post-op uh, appearance of the nasal tip. If you can show the basal view, uh, pre-op slide, <clears throat> you'll see that if, I'm sorry, we can't have them together. Um, have you got a pre-op basal view? Yeah. Yeah. And see the view of the nostrils post-op now, please. Sorry. Yeah, you see the nostril orientation also changes uh, when you advance the, when you, when you project the tip forward and the tip also assumes a more triangular shape rather than the trapezoidal or the flat shape that it had before. And the <coughs> residual defect is made good with a post auricular wolf graft, uh, which is an interim uh, graft whilst the patient gets ready to have the next procedure. Uh, we then, um, can we see the next uh, slide showing the Abbey flap? Yeah, so uh, I think we have the picture after the Abbey division. Ah, good. You yeah, can see yeah. that he so still has the deficiency of the lip. Uh, th that's him with the, with the, with the Abbey flap. Right. Uh, yes. It's restored. Yeah, I, 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 I did not keep the slides with the in, in, in between. So this is no just the temp. This, so this is what we have. So immediate, uh, maybe 10 days post-op after the wolf graft. Yes. After the primary rhinoplasty and then he underwent an abbey and uh, that's the post abbey. Yes. You, you can see that he's still got a little bit of tip retraction. He still hasn't got the symmetry. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's an improvement on what he had before. You can't make them perfect. You can try and make them better. Uh, for some reason, he didn't want ailer base excisions. I, uh, I'm not sure why he refused further treatment. I, I'm not sure as to the reasoning behind it. We didn't right. offer. Right. So shall we go on to the unilateral one? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, we don't have intra pictures yet. Yeah, okay. No. Pre and uh, post, that is, Master. Yes. Now, this is a young lady of about 22 who'd had primary uh, cleft lip and palate surgery before. And there's quite a marked um, asymmetry, a wide ala base, a deviation deformity, a nasal wall, the side wall of the nose, which leans over to the right hand side with considerable collapse of the middle vault on the cleft side. Um, and if you look at the um, profile view, uh, you can see that she has, again, an underprojected tip. Her, her radix is a little bit high. 
but she has an underprojected tip and not much of a columella show because she has a hanging ava uh, that's hiding her columella, but nonetheless, the columella is retracted and there was no super tip break. And here's her in profile post-op and what she had was a, an open structure approach, a septal extension graft, a septoplasty, a, a strut to the intercolumella uh, region to give her projection, and then a modification of the tip. Can we see the, the uh, frontal view? Um, it's not brilliant. She has still got quite significant nostril asymmetry. The insertion of the left, uh, the the the, the uh, left nostril into the cheek, the ala into the cheek, is at a higher level compared with the right, and that is a very difficult proposition to correct. Maybe right. at the time of initial lip repair, this could have been addressed. I'm not sure if it would was. Uh, but this is a deformity which I find. Nasser, Nasser can I play. can I in yes. intervene for one second? Yeah. So this yes. is this is a defect that has been created during the primary surgery. When you do ah. the a peri LR incision in the classic yes. LR, ah. the large, the the the, 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 the uh, nostril overrides higher, and then Ela, that's why, yes. Uh, yes. I, I yes. keep bringing this up at every conference or meeting I go to. And I still see people making incisions which skirt around the alar, alar, alar facial junction. And this leads to these secondary deformities, uh, which are very difficult to correct. Yes. Um, it's less than a perfect result, I'm afraid. Um, the nasal dorsum is still leaning to one side. Uh, she would need a dorsal graft. I am not sure why I didn't do a dorsal. Have you got the operating sheet there? Uh, I, I don't have that, NASA. Sorry. Yeah. But was she um, able to breathe? Was she yes. content yes. with the result? Yeah, she was uh, very much. Yeah. Yes. I'm not calling yes. this a brilliant result, but, these, uh, but this is a, a, an improvement. I'm not sure if I did an ala rim graph because I don't have the notes to refer to. Uh, but um, today I'd probably do it slightly different. I would probably address the dorsum a bit more. I would probably be a bit more aggressive with the osteotomy. She needs a, a, a low to low osteotomy on the right side in order to reposition the nasal side wall well over to the other side. And then perhaps a, 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 a dorsal graft. Um, and, and that would probably address the asymmetry of the dorsum and the middle wall. I'm open to any other questions or comments or criticisms uh, which right. I feel would be justified. Right. Now, so before I go to the others, I just have two questions to ask you of uh, clarifications. Yes. The number one is regarding the Abbey. So uh, you would prefer to do the Abbey primarily rather than doing a skin graft, right? So that option is not necessary. That's what yes. I thought I understood. So we could I, do it at the same city. Yeah, there are three categories of patients. One, right. where there's adequate lip width okay. and adequate bulk to the lip, and the pronadium that is existing is wide enough to accept a, 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 a flap and then primary closure. We've done this right. on a few patients. The right. second category is where there's not enough tissue and you do need an IV flap but they are not old enough to accept an IV flap procedure like the youngsters, I would use a wolf graft. An IV flap right. would be the third option, yes. Right, right, thank you, Nasa. So uh, I will go back to the panel, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Reddy, do you have any comments, questions to Dr. Nasa? Doctor, uh, Dr. Reddy, sir, yeah. any comments, questions? Yes, sir. No, actually, I, I can't comment on uh, Dr. Nasser's technique because I have learned a lot from him. Uh, <laughs> the only I would like to say is this, that yeah. primary rhinoplasty does more damage than good in most patients. Okay. Uh, a small child, I would um, do the minimum <laughs> possible. Um, 
may, maybe Dr. Mustafa, what's giving a little rim incision, try to suture it together, things like that. Open structure rhinoplasty, which I have seen Dr. Thomas do in Muscat, right. Right. does produce excellent results in a small percentage of patients. But there okay. are other patients uh, who don't do that well. The problem with them is when they come back, you mm. don't have a NASA everywhere. So you will have difficulty in correcting these uh, rhinoplasties because they have right. so much fat inside. Mm. Uh, I remember once one of my students said uh, he is not able to get the plane between the skin and the cartilage, and he will send right. the case. I said, "Don't send the case." So I also will have problem if you are going to have problem in getting a plane. Right. Similarly, um, preschool or uh, preteen age. To do a correct correction of the rhinoplasty, at that time I would not recommend. I would hesitate to do unless there is a gross deformity, and I, even then I would do a partial correction, and focus everything when they are in past their growth period. Maybe 16 in girls and 18 in boys is what I tell them. I, you, I ask them to come back when they finish their inter, and they have some time there and operate there. And primary, that means doing first time is always the best time to do it. And septum is the key that unless you correct the septum straight, you will not do the rhinoplasty properly. You cannot pull the alas cartilage this way, that way, put a couple of stitch. The other one is, I have seen many cases where people put conchal cartilage on top of the existing alar cartilage to increase the height. I think that's a mistake. So, because these patients have enough of alar cartilages, if they put them up to where they belong, they stay there. And Nitin Mokkal has published and described a, a good method of chondrocutaneous advancement, which gives decent results. If he is in right. the audience, you may ask him to comment. I, I, he was there in the beginning. I'm not Hitta. sure whether he's there. I'll find out if he's there. Uh, so, yeah, Mustafa, just one second. Yeah. Pramod yeah. had some question on primary rhinoplasty, so I'll let him take that and then you can comment. Pramod, <coughs> Pramod, there. He wanted to yes. discuss yes. something about uh, yeah, primary rhinoplasty. I yeah, Pramod. Do primary rhinoplasties uh, on sure, no. uh, uh, Pramod. Yeah, my question was. Uh, I can't hear him. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, Pramod, you're breaking off. Okay, we'll uh, we'll uh, uh, take that question a little later. Yes, Dr. Mustafa, yeah. your co thoughts, uh, comments, uh, questions. Uh, I'm here. Uh, my question is, uh, Ramon, my question yeah. was, was there any consensus on uh, you know primary rhinoplasty? Was there any consensus on primary uh, rhinoplasty? There doesn't seem to be, as primary you can rhinoplasty. see. As you can see, Dr. Reddy uh, 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 seems to be against it, so is Dr. Uh, Nasser. So let's hear from Mustafa. I don't think yeah. we get consensus out of these. There are always many viewpoints. So let's talk to Dr. Mustafa, his questions, his queries, his comments okay. Okay. on primary uh, and secondary rhinoplasty. Yeah. Uh, as for first, let me uh, uh, make a, a few observations about the, the definitive rhinoplasty. I wouldn't call it a secondary rhinoplasty. So if we have to do a Definitive rhinoplasty, I would not do it without addressing the skeleton and uh, without uh, uh, doing the alveolar bone grafting. And right. That is one thing. The other thing is, uh, for most of these cases of uh, definitive rhinoplasty, I would use a columnar strut and also a, a, a dorsal graft and suspend it because that would give a good uh, projection of the nose if it is under projected as uh, Nasser has just mentioned particularly in uh, the bilateral cases. And I also agree with him about the usage of uh, uh, Abbe flap in case the uh, columella is extremely short. Most of the time it does not require because it is just the displacement of the lower lateral cartilage which gives the impression of the uh, columella being very short. Now coming back to the first thing uh, which uh, Pramod also addressed and uh, which uh, Dr. Reddy had uh, shown some reservation. Uh, what we need to understand is most of the primary repair, there is a, a little bit of a, a intervention as far as the 
nose is concerned, a lot of people do what is called as the closed nasal dissection. And then uh, with the help of either mukums or some other means, they try to reorient the, uh, uh, low, uh, the displaced lower lateral cartilage. So this so-called semi-open, when I say semi-open, uh, Nasser doesn't like, because this is a terminology very commonly used among, in the cleft circles. It means that you avoid a, a transcolumnar incision or an incision based or along with the C flap. So it is nothing but an extension of the closed nasal dissection. The only difference is you are more definitive here because I've seen in many of the cases where they have done closed nasal dissection, some of my own, some done by others. There is violation of tissues, there is breach of cartilage. So a closed nasal, sorry, a semi-open dissection is uh, more definitive. You are less likely to damage the cartilage if you are extremely careful and you are physically reorienting the cartilage and, uh, uh, allow, and allowing not further relapse in the future. So far, the results I have is for three years, they look uh, quite stable. I'm not sure in the years to come, if my results are bad, I would certainly report about it. Thank you. Okay, so I, I am told that uh, Dr. Nitin Mokal is still around. Uh, Nitin, can you unmute, unmute and comment on your chondrocutaneous, chondrocutaneous flaps? Hello. Nitin? Hello. Yes, Nitin. Yes, yes Nitin. I am audible. Yes, you are. Uh, yes, it is a method which is described by Potter's because on the affected side, the lateral crust of the the lateral most extent of the LR cartilage, which is stuck down because of the scarring, and it is abnormally placed. So you have to release this lateral crura uh, ex so entire composite unit of the LR cartilage will be brought into the center as compared to the opposite side and then in the midline you have to put a columella strut and you fix both the LR cartilages to the columella strut as a even the septal extension graft the columella strut with the septal extension graft so that you are restoring the domal part that is number one and then after movement of that chondromucosal graft, a uh, flap rather, there is a skeletal defect which is left behind. So you put in another piece of a cartilage, which is called as a LR extension graft, which starts from the LR cartilage and goes up to the pyriform margin because after raising the flap, you dissect uh, the tunnel going till down to the pyriform. So you are restoring the pyramid, bony pyramid in that area. And after the movement of this chondromucosal graft, there is a raw area which is left behind. When you redrape the entire nasal skeleton, you will find that there is always excess of skin on the affected side along the LR rim. So what I do is I take an inferiorly based LR rim flap uh, which will go inside and line the defect which is created after the movement of the chondromucosal flap so that there is no raw area left inside and which you are preventing the contracture in that area and achieving the symmetry. Thank you, Nitin, for your comments. Nasa, there are a couple of questions. Can you unmute yourself, Nasa? A couple of questions to you. Uh, one is, uh, what is your opinion about diced cartilage? That's the first one. Dice cartilage is used as a filler. It's not used for structural support. If you have a concavity or a small depression in a, the nasal dorsum area, uh, you, can, you can put some dice cartilage graft. Uh, but it, uh, it, you have to make absolutely sure that this dice cartilage is wrapped in a little bit of fascia. Otherwise, it just disperses and is all over the place. It has right. no place for structural support. Right. One more question, uh, Nasa, uh, from Parit. How often do you do nasal osteotomy in cleft rhinoplasty? Can you explain how you will do your nasal osteotomy? How often well, you do it and how you Yeah, well, it like the case that we saw, um, if there is bodily displacement of the nasal bones over to the non-cleft side, then you will need to osteotomize in order to get the, mid, the bones back to the midline. On the 
where the nasal bone is not, if you get back to the picture on the, of the girl uh, with the okay. unilateral step, perhaps I can, okay. I can explain that. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that one second. Yes, yes just yes. one second. Uh, yeah. I'll go to the right presentation and I'll come back. Just the, the unilateral is what you wanted, right? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. The frontal, the basal mm. which view, NASA, frontal basal view. view. Basal view. Yeah, basal, basal view. Okay. So we have a basal view there. Yeah. Great. Uh, and have you got a frontal view as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Let me show it on the front. Look, uh, for some reason, I have failed to address her deviation. I do not know because I have no access to her notes or pre op records. I don't know why this is that. There are some times, this is where rhinoplasty is uh, humbling, where you come back and see your results after a few years and you find uh, that they're not as you thought they ought to have been. But here, I, should have, I would have done on the, on, the, on the cleft side a transverse root osteotomy. That means at the root of the nose, the osteotomy begins just above the medial canthus and goes towards the root of the nose. And then a low to low osteotomy on along the nasal facial junction. So you start low at the pyriform aperture and you go along superiorly until you meet the lower extent of the transverse root osteotomy. And then you need to do a midline, a paramedian osteotomy, so as to separate the left nasal wall completely from the septum. And then you place a wide osteotome and you gently outfracture this nasal bone. Then you would do an osteotomy on the other side, a, a similar low to low osteotomy. And in fracture the nasal bone complex over to the from to the to the left side but this must be complemented with septal correction otherwise the deformity will recur before the patient is off the table does that uh, help yeah i i'll have to find out thanks nasa so, uh, is, is there any yeah. questions, uh, Sunil, wasn't to Dr. Nasser, otherwise I'll move on. Yeah, there is a question here for Dr. Nasser. Yes. Yeah. Nasser, hi from Nagarkoil. The question is regarding septal extension graft. Yes. So, do you think a septal extension graft would have benefited for this patient who had this unilateral cleft deformity? Because when we saw the profile, it looked as if her nose had become foreshortened. This one? Uh, well... Uh, can we see the profile? Uh, you see, in hindsight, I don't know what procedure I did on this girl. I'm at a loss. Um, so you're probably right. The nose looks, the, the upper lip length looks long, but we've only got one view. We haven't got views of the other side. I haven't got a frontal view. To, to, to explain this, uh, but uh, the nasal labial angle is about 95 or maybe just a little bit more, but the lip looks long. You're quite right, there's not enough columnar to show, but please remember she also has an overhanging ala. So you are, you are right. I'm not sure if I've used the septal extension graft, whether it's been adequate to address the problem. Again, I'm not sure, but you are right. Thanks. Septal extension Thanks. graft avoids this particular short nose deformity. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. Uh, there's one last question to Mustafa and then we will sum up because we, are, we have really taken extra time. I thank everybody for waiting for so long and listening to everybody. Uh, Mustafa, are you there? This is a question yeah, yeah. for you as to yeah. where you exactly place your plates for this bone advancement. This is about okay. your... Uh, Okay, uh, at okay. protraction, the exact anatomical lo location, I want to okay. know. That's the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one is in the zygomatic buttress region. Okay. Uh, you have to be a little careful in your analysis of the x-ray 
so that uh, the screws doesn't impinge onto the roots of a uh, uh, erupting second molar. Third molar you can choose to ignore. So one on either side of the buttress, then uh, one in the chin region, particularly between the canine and the lateral incisor. Okay. So, so for the maxilla in the buttress and buttress. the mandible between the yeah. canine yeah. and the lateral incisor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think, yeah, thanks. So I think uh, I think we have had a three-hour long session. Uh, uh, so I, one I last apologize. question. Yeah, one last so question. One yeah. last yeah. Pramod, question. Pramod, you are not uh, you are breaking. You're audible is not audible. Yeah. 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 If 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 you can be heard, I will yeah. take one In... question. <laughs> so one, can you hear me? One last question. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, the question is in in bilateral lips when there is significant columnar shortening. Uh, uh, would uh, uh, an abbey be a first choice along with the rhinoplasty? Sorry, I didn't get the question. In bilateral uh, cleft tip where there is a columella shortening, would an abbey yeah. flap be a abbe first choice along with the rhinoplasty? Abbey flap for the, for for the short columella. Saw, right? A along with the rhinoplasty, along with the rhinoplasty, Yes, yes, it can be done. Be a good choice. Can I answer yes. that? Uh, yes, can I yes. Come that? on, come on, yeah. quickly. Yeah. Let's yeah. move on. See, yeah. if, if the uh, I, I mentioned this earlier, most of the time the columella is not very short. If it is very short, certainly it is a good option to use the Abbe flap. But you need to be careful in male patients because uh, you have the hair bearing area, and there will be a lot of hair on the columella. So that's the only right. concern. Thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, uh, so I will just uh, uh, want uh, everybody to sum up, starting with Bob Mann, if he's still there. I hope he, he hasn't had to go for work or something like that. Uh, I want all of you to sum up very briefly about, uh, uh, your, about the conclusions, if you will, uh, in 30 seconds each one. I'll start with Bob. Well, thank you so much, uh... Uh, Krishnamurthy for inviting me. It's just been a joy and uh, I would like to uh, say that if anybody is interested in uh, seeing any of the videos of how to do the primary work or the secondary work, um, I'm available. You can reach me on my Gmail. It's rman, r-m-a-n-n-5-2 at gmail.com. I can put you on the Google Drive. I'll be happy to Zoom anybody if they want to have me walk them through the procedures. I'm trying oh. to be available for that. Uh, once thank again, you very much. Thank, you for, thank you for everybody uh, for allowing me to participate. I hope we can do this again. Uh, I've learned a great deal. Uh, I will say Dr. Nasa and all the other excellent rhinoplasty surgeons, uh, those are challenging operations. And as you know, my philosophy is to fix it the first time uh, I can show you my techniques. Uh, so I basically do just a straightforward rhinoplasty when they're teenagers, because uh, uh, those those operations are about as complex as they get. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Have you, Bob. We day. will. We, thank you, Bob. You, we will be having you very soon, and uh, hope to see you in in, in Grand Rapids sometime. Uh, Nasser, oh, do you want to sum up? Wonderful. Yes. Thanks, well, thanks, uh, as I said to you before, um, uh, it's nothing is straightforward. Uh, I disagree with the comments of the short columella that everything is okay. It's not okay. As I explained to you, I've done a, a, a great deal of research on short columellas, and they are much more complex. It requires a lecture in its own right. Perhaps another right. day we won't, we won't do this. But please bear in mind, rhinoplasty, I don't do primary rhinoplasty, but I do what's called interceptive, which does not interfere with growth, but gives the child a little bit of psychological boost in their growing period when they're most likely to be teased or become backward. But I don't recommend the definitive procedure before they are fully grown. Uh, Thank uh, you very much, Nasa. Email, please. Doctor, my email. Please. Uh, I will send it to you. I'll send it to you. Thank you. Um, Thank uh, you. Doctor Miazini, are you? Doctor Miazini, are you still there? Yes. Yes. I. I had. Can, this can we have some? Uh, uh, parting comments from you, some summing up. It's been so nice to have you there. Like I said, we'll see you soon again. But it was great to be with you again, although online only. 
I, I learned a lot, especially about noses. That was really nice. And um, I think I will definitely write to Dr. Mann for my surgeons. Um, so expect a, a mail from me. I'm so sorry to bother you, but I think it was really interesting. Everybody was great. So every single lecture was interesting. And um, I'm a special kind of orthodontist who's particularly passionate about surgery, especially primary surgery. So today was great. You did an amazing job, Krishna Murray, as, as, as usual. We expected it. So you were awesome. Really awesome. Thank you Thank so, you. so much. Thank you. So uh, there will be a short debriefing, so don't go away. We'll have last comments from Mustafa and then we'll, uh, we'll close the meeting. Yeah, first and Dr. foremost, Mustafa. Darwin, yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. It is indeed a great honor to be a part of this panel, number one. The other thing is uh, I, I do firmly uh, endorse the idea of nasoalveolar molding wherever that is possible. But in addition, I would also correct, uh, try and uh, gain some amount of symmetry by the technique that I just described, because most of the patients in the post-operative period, uh, most of the parents are very particular about the nasal asymmetry, so that being the reason. And as far as the growth modulation is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this bone-to-bone -bone, uh, 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 protraction makes much more sense because it also has the additional advantage because you can continue with your orthodontic treatment and you can use it for a, a considerable period of time and achieve some better results compared to face mask and other things. Uh, besides that, I have nothing else to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Reddy, sir. Last word from you. Uh, it was great having this uh, meeting uh, with old friends and teachers in a way. Um, basically, I would like to say, do no harm is what we should aim at do the maximum possible without uh, leaving something which cannot be subsequently corrected. Uh, my own uh, approach to the clefts have changed uh, a lot since I started. Right. So, there are no lateral incisions, do minimum dissection, put anatomical structures in their position, leave no rye areas, the basic principles which we sometimes forget. I think the keys are based on that. So I thank uh, Bob and Nasser for sure, and Maria. She reinforced my abhorrence for facial masks. So, <laughs> so that was good listening to her. Thanks, Maria. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir. So uh, I don't have anything more to say. What we have tried to do is to uh, bring in some uh, really uh, talented and thoughtful people who have done huge amount, humongous amount of work uh, and to share their thoughts here. And I think we have succeeded. Uh, thank you very much for everybody for uh, staying on. And to all faculty, there is a, a quick debrief meeting and uh, there's a separate uh, meeting invite for that. Please join in that for a quick debrief after we finish this. Thank you very much. Pleasure is ours. Bye-bye. So the meeting Thank link you. is posted in the web, uh, the yeah, so WhatsApp we, group. We leave, so we leave this meeting and go to sir, that, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for moderating this session. We end this meeting with the, our web series song, sir. Praveen, please play. <laughs>